Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the second session, which is going to be on artificial intelligence, machine learning and big data. And I'm very pleased we have two experts. They're going to lead us through this uh, workshop. Uh, one thing I forget to mention yesterday, all the biography, I know the chairs and the moderators, all of them have been very kindly spending time and picking some information about the speakers and they uh, and, 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 and introduce them uh, in all the session but you can go to our website you will find the biography of all these speakers and also you can go to the for example like dr rawad which we're going to listen to him again he did this he had his book and before in a couple of conferences with us and you can see all his board boys uh, sorry his um, uh, videos are in the website so that's one thing. So please do not stop here, but go to the website, learn more about these people. And the whole idea was, is a global forum. Our aim is really to get people to come to connect to each other. Now, I, we, 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 in a very short introduction, I'm going to introduce the moderator of this workshop, who kindly spot or give us all this slot of his time to moderate the workshop. He's an associate professor of uh, energy and chemical engineering, but interestingly, he is uh, coming from an engineering and chemical engineering and renewable energy background. And another person I met in a, one of the conferences is a big Sergio in United Arab Emirates. He gave a presentation on artificial intelligence. Yesterday, Professor Farida, she said she has been doing work using artificial intelligence. It seems like our life is going to be heavily dominated by artificial intelligence. So when I was talking with Professor Muhammad, he told me, he, is, he has been doing lots of work on artificial intelligence. So that means, Dr. Rawad, you have lots of competitors in your field. So you need to, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, shouldn't be a disencouragement to hide something from us. So I know you are open, but I, I have seen lots of people, excellent people or uh, experts on energy and medicine in dentists yesterday. All of them now are you. That means this topic is quite important. So, Professor Muhammad, thank you very much, Professor Muhammad from the University of Southampton. He will uh, facilitate all these workshops, so I will not introduce him again. So I will stop here. Uh, one thing I'm sure he will explain it, but this is going to be slightly different than the normal session because it is more of a small mini workshop. But we promise, because we've just been lucky, we got four of them, they speak different language. I know Rawat, sorry, Rabia speak French as well. But we are also aiming to deliver this workshop in full in three days in Arabic or in French. I don't know, but we will see. So I will stop here and the floor is yours, Dr. Uh, Professor Mohammed. Say. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Alam. Uh, as Dr. Alam said, my name is Mohammed Hassan. I'm from the University of Southampton. I am the program director for chemical and sustainable engineering. And as Dr. Alam alluded to, I have dabbled in the data sciences world myself. It seems to be the new norm nowadays. And that's what we are hoping through this platform to explain to people uh, how data sciences and machine learning, artificial intelligence impact on everyday life. So before I start introducing my guests here and alluding and uh, taking them through their presentations, I wanted to give you a brief introduction about artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is a branch of computer sciences. It's where the machines become intelligent. And we break it down into kind of four elements between a reactive machine that you give it some rules and it reacts to it, between a machine that has a limited learning in terms of learning how to behave in a certain way, like a self driving car, for instance, where you give it some condition, it starts behaving itself. And then we move on to the theory of mind, where machines start behaving in cultures like we do as humans, and they start developing their own uh, artificial intelligence, in other words, here. And then we move on towards the self-awareness, where they actually have cognitive recognition. And for machines to actually learn and derive all these things here, we need the data sciences behind it. And as Deming said, uh, one of the economists from the US said, in God we trust, but all others must bring data. We need data to actually justify it. And data is at the heart of the data sciences, in other words, because data sciences is all around gathering this set of data, putting the data in a uniform, comprehensive manner, recognizing the patterns and the trends behind them, and then creating the algorithms that will be able to predict. And we can't predict the future, but at least from historical learning, we can actually go forward in time with it. And this is where the data sciences 
brings in the elements of the machine learning to then enable the artificial intelligence. In my own work as a chemical engineer and especially within the energy systems, I've used it several ways in terms of looking at the properties being generated from different reactions or different fuel systems being uh, applied or tested, where we look at the sets of data being produced and then we apply algorithms using softwares like Python or Panda, um, MATLAB is our favorite if we can afford the license, and then move forward with that in terms of generating these algorithms using the set of data in terms of a historical learning, just like a child, you, you go through the data and you look at the patterns and you try to analyze what is happening there. And then from then on, the machine will learn how to behave the data or how to analyze the data and learn how to pick up the patterns between the data once the data is organized in a correct manner for us to move forward with it. So for today's workshop, Dr. Alam and the World Sustainability Organization, have got the three of the brightest minds we have around here. We have Dr. Rawat Hamid from East London University, and we have Dr. Ahmed Dawood from Coventry Business School, and Dr. Rabi from the Bioinformatic European Center. And they're all experts in their fields here. They have published several papers, a multitude of papers. As Dr. Alam said, they are present in uh, everywhere to do with the data sciences. So without further ado, I would like Dr. Rawat Hamid to take over and start defining to us what artificial intelligence is all about in a knowledgeable manner rather than my haphazard description. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Thanks, Dr. Alam, for the invitation again. Uh, I think you've described the AI uh, brilliantly, Dr. Mohammed. So there's no need to re-identify that. I'll start. I think probably just to you want to share a presentation make with us? make it short yeah I'll start by sharing my presentation here okay so that's let me know when you see my presentation please yep good so thanks again for the invitation so today we are covering part of the AI workshop um, so we have a workshop for AI data science at the new norm uh, part one would be introduction to AI, machine learning, and big data. And as you all know, this is a very extremely uh, demanding and uh, large topic that we cannot cover uh, during one hour and a half or maybe less than that because we are a little bit late on the program. So what I'm trying to do at this in this session, we will divide it into two parts. Um, the first part... Uh, yeah. Okay. I will speak, and on behalf of Dr. Mohammed Bahja as well from Birmingham University, we'll speak about knowledge representation and the role of that in developing AI-related systems. And the second part, part B, Dr. Ahmed Dawood will be speaking about Industry 4.0. So it's all about AI, but we can't cover the whole AI spectrum, machine learning, and big data in one hour, approximately. So. Let me jump first to the part one outline. I'll speak about the knowledge. Why do we need knowledge for AI? And how can we represent that knowledge? And finally, we'll give you some hints on what we call ontology engineering, which is a very effective way to, um, which is a very effective way to develop uh, an AI related systems. Okay, so let me start now, trying to put my timer as well, just to make sure that I'm not exceeding the time too much. So yeah, the discussion that we will kick off here, we all know that we have um, AI systems, okay? Before we know and talk about AI system, let's talk about we as a human, okay? Now as a human, we make decision based on what? Based on knowledge, definitely, based on our own experiences in this life. And how can we make decision? You have the information about X and Y and Z, but you can't make a decision based on that information. You need to have this information represented in your mind, okay? And then you need to have some how rules, some wisdom, some kind of uh, opinion about things that allows you to, to judge whether option A is better for you than option B. And then you can make the decision later on. So these are the things that we would like to cover in our short presentation. Now, ideally, if we have this um, session face-to-face, I wouldn't define ontology or knowledge and knowledge representation without kicking off a discussion with audience. What do you think is knowledge? Uh, what is knowledge representation from your point of view? Now, I don't know if we can manage this online due to the number of uh, 
participant maybe or the um, level of attendees. Um, not sure if we can do that, but I will try quickly to cover these things um, very quickly, just to avoid the time uh, delay. So if I move to the next slide, I will say knowledge usually is understanding of a subject, okay? It can be represented or can be a concept, can be fact about any area. It can be relations between something or it could be a mechanism for how things work in the real life. So if I would like to model university, we've listened to the uh, university, entrepreneurship university talk. So if I would like to talk about university, then the concept university is um, programs, lecturers, um, students, materials, topics, and so on. So these are concepts. We have some facts like student studies modules, student enroll in a program, some of these kind of information. Now relationship between these concepts are so important. So I know that students are enrolled in a certain program. We need to know that can student be enrolled in more than one program or not? Can student be registered in one module or not? Or more, so something like this. So need to have the somehow relation between these kind of concepts and also mechanism, how students go and study in the university through a process one, two, three, four, five, six. So these are all knowledge that we need to codify in our system in order to be allowed to make decision and make our systems more intelligent. Okay, so why knowledge? Is it related to AI? Yes, it's related to AI, definitely. The branch of computer science that studies among other things, the nature of human knowledge, understanding and mental skills that we have in AI. So this is part of the AI of course, and this is related to the knowledge and knowledge representation. The goal of AI, of course, is to develop programs that work as a human, okay, and what we call them intelligent software system or intelligent behavior. Let me just again move this, shift it here. Okay, and again, in order to do that, we need to have a representation for the knowledge that we have in the computer so we can move forward and make decisions. So let's move to the next slide. Knowledge need to be stored somewhere, obviously. And of course, most important, they need to be retrieved. So if I know that Rawad is a computer uh, science student, but I can't store that kind of information in the machine, then there will be no advantage for that, okay? So I need to store the knowledge and I need to retrieve the knowledge when I need it, okay? So I need to find the knowledge whenever I need in order to make sure that I can access it and provide the benefit out of that. And also I need to make reasoning about the knowledge. What is reasoning? Reasoning means that we need to use the knowledge that we have and other strategies also, all the strategies that we have programmed in our systems to solve the problems, to make somehow um, some recommendations in order to make decisions or conclusions. So I know that Rawad has a very good understanding for AI concept. He has finished his first degree in computer science. He has some interest in field number one, two, three, four then I can recommend to him in an intelligent way that there are some programs in AI in the area that you are living that you can go for and study and develop your skills. Furthermore, if I know more information about Rawad, then I will be able to provide him with more clever recommendations. So let's say if Rawad has interest in smart cities, which is, can be part of AI related application, and I know among the 10 universities that we have, and they offer AI related courses. There are two universities who have very good relationship with industry in smart city. Sorry, <clears throat> let me just, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. And we have two universities only among the 10. The two universities have very good relationship with industry in the smart city field. So I will definitely recommend the two university instead of the 10. So the more information I know about Rawad, the more information I know about the users, the more knowledge I have, the clever structure I have, the more intelligent my system will be, okay? So let's quickly move to the um, more important cues here. So the process, if I would like to retrieve a knowledge, if I would like to gather a knowledge, if I would like to organize the knowledge, that's all a very huge kind of um, domain in AI, okay? So we can't again um, speak about all of that. We'll cover only part of knowledge representation. So knowledge representation can have a lot of definitions. 
I'll go by quick definitions here and we'll speak about the role. Here I'm speaking about the role of knowledge representation. Okay, knowledge representation is most fundamentally a substitute for the knowledge itself, for the thing, okay? Why? Because we need to have this kind of information about ourselves in the machine, okay? So if I told you now, there is a book, you haven't seen a book before, let's say this is the assumption, there is a book somewhere, and then I try to give you some description for that book. The book is a small design, okay? Its dimension is 10 centimeters by 12 centimeters, okay? The book has 400 pages, the book color is yellow, and then these pages are numbered. In. So you haven't seen the book by itself, but you now you gain some information about that thing, about that object, about the book itself. And you can describe it, you can uh, answer some of the question if you've been asked about it. So this is somehow the role of the knowledge representation. Again, knowledge representation here is a set of ontological commitment. Now the word ontology come from philosophy initially. So it's not a AI related terms uh, in, in initially. So it's, it's coming from philosophy to understand things and relations between them. Now we use that term ontology in AI in order to describe things as uh, facts and as a relationship between them, okay? So ontology can be represented as, or can be defined as an explicit representation of the fact that we have all the things that we have okay so we can say this is uh, ontology or knowledge representation is sorry knowledge representation is a set of ontological commitments that answer the question that we have okay again another definition for knowledge representation is a fragmented theory about intelligent reasoning so if i know that i will be answering question about concept a or b or c then I should know more information about them and I should have a level of inference, okay? Inference means I can make decision about things that are not in front of me. So I know Rawad is a student in computer science. He finished his first degree. He also um, did her, his, his MSc, let's say at the moment, all in AI. Then my assumption based on his history that he will be interested in doing further study to go for PhD level. And that's why I can make an inference here to say, yes, Rawad will go for PhD and I would recommend a related domain for him, okay? Again, uh, what we can see in Amazon, for example, when Amazon shows you a lot of products, Amazon did not know that you already, um, you, you want to buy, for example, a fridge, but Amazon knows that from your behavior, previous behavior, you bought similar products and also you want to buy something like this. So he, as Amazon system, can recommend to you somehow a similar product. Okay, now, now in Amazon, that is not very intelligent, but because it depends on your history of uh, purchases, but uh, AI techniques can make that hugely um, different, significantly different. Okay, the fourth slide here about knowledge is the kind of uh, medium uh, for pragmatically efficient computational way of thinking, okay? So again, it's about recommendation. Uh, I talked yesterday about recommending resources for students. So if I know a student will study a um, mathematic uh, topic, like for example, solving equations from first degree, then I know that they will be looking for resources. So I look for the resources that is available for student X and I recommend that learning resources for him, I would recommend different resources for different students to study the same lesson. Why? Because that student is learning by different approach. He has some kind of misconception or missing conception. Okay, so that's the kind of recommender inferences that we are trying to cover here. Finally, last slide about recommend uh, knowledge representation. It's a medium for human expression, and it's very important for us to talk to with computers in, uh, in a common language. Now, if I speak English, you speak French, we can't understand each other. We need a medium between both of us. If we have the best knowledge and we can't talk to each other, then there will be no opportunity to, to, to learn from that. Uh, what we are trying to do in cognitive computing and neuroscience probably is try to structure a way that we and computer can learn from each other. And this is one of the hope that we are trying to find in the next future, probably a couple of um, decades or something. So knowledge representation versus knowledge reasoning. Again, knowledge reasoning mostly is about problem solving strategies, okay? So I don't provide the program with uh, what or know what. We have two kind of things, sir, know what and know how, okay? 
So I don't, in normal programming, if I would like, for example, to program using Java programming language, a calculator, I type the rule for the program, how to action things, how to perform the task that it will be given to the program. In the AI related programming, this is different. We don't give the program the way how to behave. We give them the, sorry, we don't give them the way that how to structure, we just give the program the final result and what it should be. And then we give the program the strategy in order to solve the problem. And based on the input, the program will structure the solution and will present the solution, okay? So in our case, in our scenario, we have problem solving strategies. That problem solving strategy will be valid for Rawad, for Muhammad, for Ali, for everyone else, okay? With different inputs, okay? And that's what we are trying to do here. Now, this is a bit different probably from data science, from machine learning, but this is valid at the moment in knowledge representation. So for the knowledge, I need to represent what I know, what I don't know, and what also what I'm not sure about. So if I know that uh, Rawad is a student in computer science, I can recommend him some courses. What is the need to know why Rawad, what, what is the need if, if I, if I would like to say, I don't know what Rawad is studying. No, that's very important as well. Why? Because if I don't know what is he studying, what he's doing, then I, don't, I can't recommend to him something like this. I need to look for further information. Okay? Um, another thing that I would like to talk about here, if I'm not sure about something, okay, then I should be also explicitly saying that. Why? If I'm not sure about something, then I can make a recommendation with some certainty factors that we can talk about them later on. So one example here, if, if it's raining and Jane does not have her umbrella, then she will get wet. So this is a recommendation or this is a conclusion or inference that we do here. Now, the more information I have about raining, is it heavily raining or just shower? That will make my decision more accurate, okay? The more information about the umbrella that Jane will have, Will also will make my decision more accurate. So if the umbrella is just small one that we tend to use in our bag when we go to university, that will be not very suitable for the heavy raining. But if it's a very big um, umbrella, then that will be also something good. Now, types of knowledge are very important things. We are a very complex creature. We are human, very complex creature. We can't have all of our knowledge represented in a computer system. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if you can see the top word here. The first type of knowledge, procedural knowledge. Procedural knowledge like strategies, agendas, procedures you need to do, and so on. So when you go, for example, to any meeting, you have an agenda in front of you and in front of everyone. So we'll cover the topic one, two, three, four, five. Or if you'd like to do an experiment, then you have a procedure. These are procedural knowledge. There are some procedures between it. There are other types of knowledge, declarative knowledge where you're talking about concepts, you're talking about facts, you're talking about objects, describing them, okay? And this kind of knowledge is more appropriate for our daily life and the human intelligence that we have. The third part of the knowledge is the meta knowledge. Meta knowledge is a kind of higher level of knowledge, can make kind of abstraction, okay? And again, there are many other types of knowledge here, heuristic knowledge, structural knowledge, uh, index, uncertain knowledge, common sense, and so on. We can't cover all of that, but this slide just to show you that we have a very complex way as a human uh, creature to codify the knowledge inside our mind and inside our brain. And what we need to do here is just to try to mimic the human ways of doing things in, in computer. Now, we can't efficiently do all of that, but we can cover part of it. So let's move to the next slide and see what we can do. So for example, knowledge type here is the procedure knowledge, for example. It provides you with how to do something, for example, how to determine if Chris and Maria is older, okay? Now this probably very easy, find their ages. So if Maria is six years old, Chris is seven years old, then Chris is older, okay? Again, uh, in procedure knowledge, we focus on task that must be performed in a particular uh, way to achieve a particular objective or goal. So I care about how to um, wash a specific uh, cup in order to get it clean. So this is a task that I need to perform, okay? Again, this can be 
convey to the user using procedures, rules, and so on. Declarative knowledge is knowledge about something that is true or false, or a description of something. It's a fact, like this car has four tires. Maria is older than Chris. Uh, this house is a very old house, it's a Victorian house and so on. So it refers to a representation of, of an object or event or uh, knowledge about facts and relationship between these kind of things, okay? And under this kind of knowledge, you will have uh, concepts, facts, object, preposition, assertion, semantic net, a lot of kind of, a lot of um, types of the knowledge that you can um, represent in the computer in order to describe what you'd like to describe. So if you can see in this slide, the key takeaway from this slide is do not look at our mind as human and all of the knowledge in our mind in, in just only in one way. There are multiple types of knowledge type. There are multiple types of ways that we need to use in order to store our knowledge and how to deal with the knowledge, okay? In order to organize it, structure it, retrieve it, and use it whenever needed. So knowledge representation technique in computers, we have various ways to do that. We have object attribute value triple. So we can use that kind of simple <clears throat> way of organizing knowledge. Uh, we have also uncertain facts because not all things that we know, we are certain about it. We have fuzzy facts. Fuzzy fact also, it's a kind of uncertainty, but with severe uncertainty, I would call it. We have rules that will never change, for example, if you study, then you will success, you will pass the exam. And of course, there is some uncertainty in this, but there are some rules without uncertainty as well. We have semantic networks to present complex structure. And also we have frames, which is a, another complex um, concept that we, we might talk about if we have some time. So let's move here just to make sure that we are covering things in, in the very basic level. So we talked about object tribute value, okay? Now, we make sure that whatever information we have about X, there is no single way to represent it in the computer. You can represent it in many, many ways, okay? Now, this depends on you. So this, there is an element of subjectivity here when we design AI system, okay? One way of doing this is object attribute value. So let's say I would like to describe a ball. Then I can say the ball is the object here okay, which I'm referring to. And again, yellow is the color and the relationship between the ball and yellow is color, okay? Now you can replace this object attribute value. And again, I'm saying this is the object, ball is the object, colors attribute, yellow is the value. You can replace it with any kind of um, <coughs> relation or topic. For example, student is the object studies is the attribute and then yellow we will replace it with for example artificial intelligence module or um, computer science program something like that so why do we need to represent this kind of information if i know this student studies this kind of programs then i can recommend further resources to him i can recommend it, i can recommend communities to him so he can join these communities and learn and apply the knowledge he learned at universities, okay? And we need to know that in a machine way, in an automatic way, without, you know, going back and asking him about what information you have, um, what interest you have, and so on, okay? So you can represent a large number of um, knowledge, uh, information here, and uh, attributes using this simple and basic stru structure of knowledge representation. We tend to use this in, in many, many ways, even an XML file and, um, and RDF files also as well. These are all um, similar techniques. Now move to next one, technique number two. What if I have uncertainty in my representation? So for example, I know this river is long, okay? But I'm not sure to what extent this is, this is a long river. So I know this river, river length long, but the certainty factor here is 0 0.5, okay? So there is a possibility when I make a decision, that there is a possibility that my decision might be right or might be wrong based on this certainty factor, okay? 
if you go back again to the example about uh, raining and gene, if I know that um, it's raining now, okay, weather raining at the moment, okay, and the certainty factor of that is 0 0.8, then the marginal or margins for my error could be 0 0.2 because I know it's, it's raining. Now, if I know also about more about the rain by itself, the rain drop size is, let's say, 0 0.3. So then I can classify this is not a very heavy raining. It's somehow heavy raining, but it's, um, it's not that heavy. If I have more information about um, rain, and of course drop size, and the drop size is, uh, let's say, one centimeter, but it's obviously very heavy, then I'll say that will be a very heavy raining, okay? You can have the certainty factor if you are not certain, but if you are certain, then you can ignore that uncertainty. Next technique, if we have a fuzzy fact, this is a compl complex um, way of modeling uh, knowledge. You could have somehow uh, an information about a person, okay? And you could look at the membership value. Membership value is a somehow more complicated um, way of modeling our uncertainty if we compare it to the certainty factor. So you know the age, and you have young or middle age or old, okay? And instead of having a very specific number, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, you need to have more accurate number ranging from one, for example, to zero, okay? And depending on the age. So if my age at this moment is, let's say, 38, then I would not need to look at this from the perspective of having this kind of membership value, okay? So instead of giving yourself a certainty factor, then you are talking about more complex representation. Now, obviously, this is a very, very simplified example of the fuzzy fact, but the more fuzziness that we have in our system, the more accurate we will be in modeling our knowledge as a human. Now, let me explain this again. If you go back to your mind and investigate the majority of what you have, the majority of knowledge you have in your mind, you'll find a large number of this knowledge is not 100% um, fact, not 100% true all the time. So you know the weather is good in summer because you can go for a picnic, for example, or you can go to the park, but that's not always true. It depends again on the summer. It might be extra hot. It might be extremely boiling, and then you can't go outside. Okay, or it might be different from one place to another. So there will be always, or not always, most of the time there will be uncertainty, okay, in many, many scenarios. And now uncertainty cannot be just only 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. There are more complex ways to do it. And that's what we call fuzzy logic. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I'll move to the rule, okay? Rules are very complex uh, way to model our knowledge. One of its, uh, if it's, of its formula is the if then rule, okay? If the time now, if I'm just looking at this, if the time is after midnight, okay, and I'm hungry, then I shouldn't eat now. This is, for example, one of the rules. So you need to have if and then at the end of the statement. And then you apply this to any certain instant. When I say instant, is as an individual, is a person. So if Rawad is, is, is hungry at the moment, and the time is after midnight, then Rawad should not eat now. And again, this kind of knowledge is a domain specific. So for example, for someone, he would say if the time is after midnight and I'm hungry, then I should eat or I can eat. But if the time is after 2 a.m. and I'm hungry, then I should not eat now. So the knowledge is um, dependent here in this way. So the knowledge depends on the domain that we are using, depends on the people who are working, depends on the software that we are trying to develop. Nothing wrong or nothing right. You just need to develop a knowledge base to codify the knowledge about certain domain that will work for certain people or certain software system. Going back to real life example, if we have, for example, um, banking system, 
okay and you would like to do somehow rules to look at the uh, for example the um, what we call financial crimes for example or other kind of stuff uh, so let me just say in the chat I guess I have some okay nine to go okay that's fine thank you so if I need to um, for example to codify that kind of knowledge then I'll go for the domain of banking and then try to see how they uh, look at these kind of rules let's move to the next slide now okay um, another way to model this for example if the time is after midnight and again I have some certainty factor here because I don't know the time now and I'm hungry there is no certainty factor because I know that if I'm hungry or not then the I shouldn't eat now and look at the certainty factor of the decision is minus 0 0.5 because your decision is not 100% sure you're not sure about your 100% again if the meal is hot then I shouldn't eat before a certain point let's move to the next um, slide talking about semantic network it's a complex relationship between objects so I know again going back to the simplified example I know Robert is a student and he studies a module then I can recommend certain things why do I need to go back to the same model if we are talking about online learning now and I know AI module is structured as 10 lessons okay lesson number five dependent is de it depends on lesson number four okay so if Rawad studied lesson number four did the quiz for that lesson and he succeeded he passed that quiz then he is definitely going to go to or he's eligible to go to study number uh, lesson number five if he did not pass lesson number four quiz then he should not be allowed to access lesson number five because he will not be able to understand the topic so the more information I provide about the lessons okay about the learning outcomes learning goals and so on will be more useful for the system to make these kind of knowledge and decisions more accurate okay here is a semantic network that we have about a dog for example and we can know that the dog okay has legs okay and the number of legs are or the number is four okay so this is a kind of knowledge representation so you have an object dog has leg okay so this is attribute value okay and then you have another relationship between leg and four leg number of four okay now you need to have a dog and there are three different types of the dog it could be bulldog setters and it could be liberators okay and you have billy as an instant as an individual so billy is an uh, is one of the dog that you have okay and of course you could have 10 or 20 now if you have different types of dog then the food that you need to recommend for these dogs are different for example or you can't take them for a walk out um, all at the same time or in the same way okay uh, or they, you can't keep them at the same place and so on so these kind of things you need to look in when you have the information I would like to provide an exercise there for discussion but I think we don't have the proper time so I would love to have somehow reflection on the procedure and knowledge relative knowledge meta knowledge that we have as human but this is probably uh, something that you can do um, when you uh, finish that when we finish the lecture on your own time so let's move on to the next uh, way so knowledge representation languages again um, we've been talking about knowledge representation in a very abstract way this is a central component for AI systems how can we model knowledge representation okay there are many languages to do that and the, this all depends on the topic that we have depend on the knowledge that we have the overall goal is to reach what we have what we call intelligent systems okay in order to reach that intelligent system I need to look at the time processes actions event entities that I have in my own system in my own domain and come up with a proper decision which language I be using okay so for example if I would like to talk about logic based representation languages like propositional logic okay then I would say for something like this a and B will lead to C okay and you will have uh, an example if the princess is in the palace and the king is in the garden then the king cannot see the princess so this is a decision that you make 
or this is an inference that you have at the moment. Why? Because they are sitting in two different places and then the decision is they can't or the inference they can't see each other. Why? Because the way that we know about the, the palace and the garden is anyone who's sitting in the garden cannot see the palace or cannot see who's inside the palace. But it might be, there might be a scenario that someone who's sitting in the palace can see the, anyone in the garden or vice versa. So you model these kind of things based on your own awareness of the domain. If you know that anyone in the garden can see someone in the palace or vice versa, then you can say, no, the decision that king can see the princess, okay? So it's your role as, a, as an ontology engineer to develop that and uh, put these kind of rules in the proper way. Again, knowledge representation language, you could use first order predicate calculus, okay? Where you have um, universal quantifier or existential quantifiers. So there is, there will be a student, for example, if a student is a male or female and has registered a module, then you can certainly recommend some, some more um, characteristics or feature for that students, okay? There are some examples there as well about the use of predicate calculus. So if a mother is a woman, if a mother would like to be described as you described mother is a woman and that mother should have a child, okay? And the child need to be a person, okay? Father should be a man and at the same time he has a child as well. And the parent should be mother or father, okay? Now, grandmother need to be defined in a way that is a mother and she has a child, but the child is parent, not a person, okay? And you can describe more relationship, for example, mother with many children is the mother with, and she's a mother and she has three children or more. Now, this could be different. Maybe one of the families said, uh, mother with many children is more than two or more than one, okay? So that, that's only a subjective way of codifying knowledge. Again, uh, knowledge representation language, we could talk about rules. Uh, we have Swirl in AI, which is semantic web rule language, okay? Again, these are all complex AI related techniques. So what I'm trying to do here is just talking about ontology because this is a simplified way of doing things. Again, ontology came from a Greek ontos, the world of being, okay? So philosophy, it refers to the subject of existence, but then now we have to use this in AI to describe things in a more clever way. So I would just like to pause here and ask the moderator how much time I still have before I continue. You have one minute. Oh, okay, one minute. So, okay, so let me wrap up then. So the ontology, if we go for the ontology, more detailed description here can be found. And I think the presentation will be shared with all of you. So it's an extremely good way to, to, to use an AI. I've done it to develop AI related system for education. And for example, we can describe a model or a domain in this way. So you can, you know that the musician plays using an, a certain instrument and he plays, at, he or she plays at the events and also people who would like to attend this, attend this event, also musician record albums, okay? You can model a very huge domain using this kind of things. Let me just show you very quickly. These are three huge ontologies. Gene ontologies talk about biology and the relationship between genes and our bodies. And there are, a hu there are huge attempts there to um, build ontologies for gene. You can look at this um, link later on and see the gene ontology. Look at the structure to see how complex this ontology is, okay? And how the relationship can be really useful to understand the domain. Uh, next slide, okay, I'll skip this one, okay? Because this is quite a technical one, okay? Now this is a practical session. I think you can do it within, uh, on your own if you would like to learn more about the concept. There is a very useful um, ontology guideline called Ontology 101, okay? So that Ontology 101 is, is a huge, uh, is, a, is a very good example to start with. So you can explain ontology engineering methodology and evaluate your ontology based on the concept that you would like to learn. So here is the point to consider. And this is the basic element of ontology. You need to have classes, 
you need to have properties and then you need to have restriction or relationship between them and this is the methodology that I would like you to follow if you'd like to understand more about this topic at the end of this slide you need just for example this topic you determine the scope of your ontology and the domain I would like to do ontology related um, uh, ontology related on the uh, sorry I would like to develop an ontology about biology okay the scope I can't cover all the biology in one ontology so for example we talk about gene ontology and then we consider reusing other ontology if there are ontology and there will be ontologies okay then you enumerate the important terms in your ontology define them bless them link them with each other and then define the classes and the hierarchy okay and then define the properties and finally define the facet of the slot the values and look at this in a more holistic way and you will see something like the Siemens as a company produces computers okay Siemens is the domain and the slot is produces and the range is computers also students studies a course and so on okay now you create more instances you describe Rawad as a student Muhammad is the lecturer Alam is the leader for the course and so on here is the ontology 101 guidance you can click on that and you can practice this on time in your time if you have the uh, willing to learn more about ontology if you have more questions i would be happy to answer and um i'll leave you now with the uh, with the module with the facilitator just to allow a little bit of question and answer and then we move to the second part of this uh, workshop thanks thanks Mohammed. over to you Thank you very much, Rawad. Very interesting to expose us to ontology engineering. Uh, it's, uh, it's a new concept to all of us. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the concept of knowledge management and explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge, but to then bring in the knowledge in terms of representation and reasoning and then break the knowledge in terms of the concepts and the relationships between them and uh, the ability to store and access the data and reason the data, you, you build up a good momentum or a good fundamental for us to actually define knowledge itself in a more in-depth and you brought in the elements of the reasoning and the representation in a very good concise manner. Uh, there's a question here from Professor Joseph. Can you provide more information on frames? Are they similar to schemes? Dr. Rawad? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No. yeah, so the themes um, frame is a little bit more complex in terms of codifying the um, Let's say the the uncertainty and where we structure the knowledge. Okay, so if I would go for simplified ways of um, Of codifying let's say relationship between objects Rawad studying a um, uh, Let's say uh, a modules or a program then that's true for certain scenarios. But now, what if I would like to make more uh, complicated decision that is not just only dependent on what Rawad is doing at the moment or what Rawad is, is studying. I need to make decisions that is related to his previous situation, for example, or the way he would like to interact with other colleagues and so on. So I need to use a different data structure, which is AI data structure that divide knowledge into substructure to represent somehow stereotyped situations okay uh, this was invented i guess in in 70s in 1970s at some point so again frame is is, is a, it's an intelligent to say data structure an ai okay and um, they use also ontology set but they have a very specific representation and reasoning schemas okay and i can um, go back I guess to the uh, I guess the book of AI a modern approach which I'm teaching my my student uh, at the moment in the university um, we we tend to teach frames as uh, as the last complex object for the uh, last complex concept for the um, for the student because it, it talks about what we call semantic network and semantic calculus okay um, and I'm sure we we can talk about this more if you want, but this is uh, I think we need to simplify things like linked data before, and how this can be built on that. So hopefully I've, I've answered uh, the questions. Thank you very much for that. It's uh, it's given us uh, food for thought so far. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> it's given us you. food for thought in terms of uh, uh, now we know 
what knowledge is in a more depth understanding, we understand some elements of the analytical situation between the representation and, and the reasoning elements of it. And you've just given us an, a quick, brief introduction to the frames and the schemes and the relationships between them. So I think this is a, a good opportunity for us to move to Dr. Ahmed Dawood, who will take us more into the data sciences. Dr. Ahmed Dawood comes from Coventry University Business School. He uses um, a lot, he's published a lot of paper in these areas and into the data sciences, uh, how people use social medias and other things like that. And I'm sure he is, he's going to take the knowledge management aspects that were presented by Dr. Rawad and help us move forward in our understanding of these systems. So Ahmed, without any further ado, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for this uh, big introduction. Uh, thank you for uh, you all guys for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor uh, to, to be with you um, all today. Uh, actually, my presentation will be a continuation of what Rawad started, but from business perspective. Uh, so I will introduce some, uh, like something I, I can consider a bit recent and new. Uh, which is uh, the DEM Industry 4. Yeah. So I will be speaking about Industry 4, um, uh, the story and the application. Because of the time limit, I will try to be uh, a bit short, uh, way shorter than Rawad at least. So, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm uh, Ahmed Daoud. I work at Coventry Business School as a lecturer in business analytics. So, um, uh, because it's it's a e uh, e conference of it's it's e meeting, uh, I mean face to face when you go to class or when you go to conference face to face, you see people, you give a smile, uh, you you shake hands. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do this one in the Corona uh, uh, time. Uh, so I try for online teaching. I always try to start uh, with my students with something positive, uh, break the ice, especially at the first time. So with you guys, I, I decided to start with a very positive uh, perspective of my daughters, how she see our planet. Um, so she, she see it as stuffed uh, with, um, with love. My daughter is uh, Tia and uh, she's nine years uh, old. Uh, so yeah, this is some positive uh, uh, ideas to start with. Uh, the content of my um, presentation, first I will be introducing the, the, the concept of Industry 4, definition, key terms and benefits, the impact of Industry 4 on traditional working structure, uh, and uh, the objectives will be understanding the, uh, how Industry 4 developed or evolved, uh, uh, to examine how Industry 4 works, uh, and explain Industry 4 key terms and uh, address industry for impact and uh, potentials. So, um, introduction on this, uh, in old age, once upon a time, the role of technology leadership was to keep the lights on. That's all they, uh, they used to do in old ages. Now, they must be aware of all uh, latest tools and technologies, decide which will best advance their organization's goals uh, to be able to compete, uh, sustain, and uh, move uh, forward. So what we mean by Industry 4 as, as, as one of the tools, uh, uh, recent tools uh, to be used in manufacturing, um, it, 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 it is the term referred to, the, uh, uh, to or describe the networking uh, and the continuous real-time communication of man, machine, product, process, and uh, environment. So if you look at uh, Industry 4 from uh, a pragmatic approach uh, and from a historical perspective. Uh, let's see if we can put those um, four pictures in order uh, as, a, as, a, as a simple um, uh, test. Uh, so we have four, four pictures, starting with picture A, uh, presenting electric powered uh, assembly line and mass production. Uh, picture B, cyber physical system, internet of things, smart technologies. Uh, picture C represent automation computers and uh, electronics, and uh, picture D uh, present mechanical production and uh, water and steam uh, production. If you want, you can share your uh, views in the, in the chat box, or should we, from the newest to the oldest? 
Well, I'll, I'll have a go at the moderator. I think uh, we started off with D, and then we went on to A, and then C, and then B, because initially we had uh, an industrial revolution that built on the electrical knowledge that we automated, and now we're moving into the internet of things and the cyber and the machine. The robots are taking over, basically. Exactly, exactly. And this is what we call it um, uh, Industry 4. So in 1784, we started with Industry 1, where we have mechanical production, water and uh, steam production. And this is what we called it, uh, I mean, at the beginning of uh, Industrial Revolution. And 100 years later, if you look at the gap between each uh, progress, Industry 1 and Industry 2, uh, uh, it's almost 100 years, one century. Uh, uh, industry two, where we started having electric powered machines, moving another hundred years almost, uh, having industry four in 1969, where we have automation, computers, and elect uh, electric uh, electronic uh, uh, production or manufacturing. Now you see the gap; it's left within within less than 40, let's say 40 years. We have industry four, so the the, the development of uh, technology is getting faster and faster. Industry 4, when we talk about cyber physical system, Internet of Things, smart technologies, uh, uh, production. So, Industry 1, 2, 3, and Industry uh, 4, which, we, uh, which the one we live in now. Now, uh, how will machine communicate? Machine can communicate with each other uh, through what we call as uh, now just identifying or, or the, the discussion the terms. Uh, if you heard the word uh, Internet of Things, uh, for un, uh, I mean people unexpected in this field, they may ask what we mean by Internet of Things. Internet of Things is simply when two machines communicate. And we have Internet of People or Internet of Human, they call it in uh, computer science. Uh, in business, we call it Internet of uh, People, where this is when uh, people and machine communicate. So we have Internet of Things when machine to machine communicate, and Internet of People or Human when a machine and a human uh, communicate. So machine can you com communicate with each other and with the manufacturers to create what we are, what we can call a cyber physical production system, CPPS. All of this will help to integrate the real world into a virtual one and enable machines to collect uh, live data, which is the most important things now. I mean, collect real time information. We have a, a, a lorry uh, pro, pro, broken down in uh, Scotland, and you your head head office in um, in London, and you need to know uh, how they how they um, operate. If there's any issue, if there's any breakdown, so in your in your central system, they get straight information that one lorry gets broken down in uh, Scotland, so they react so quickly instead of the lorry to wait and call and get uh, uh, in touch with the uh, specialized team. Straight away, the specialized team get information that the, the lorry, or, or not even uh, broken down, this lorry may bre break down because of uh, the pressure on the tires, the, because of any mechanical issue. When the machine communicates, they can even uh, give you hints in advance uh, to know if this lorry could break down within two, three, four hours or two, two three days. So you are ready and prepared uh, for, uh, I mean, for this uh, scenario. So then you can make a decision based on uh, this uh, real-time information. So key terms of Industry 4, uh, smart sensors. Uh, this uh, comes with machines, uh, for example, or uh, with, uh, with vehicles. Um, Internet of Things, we spoke about machine-to-machine -machine communication, uh, big data analytics, uh, when, we have a, when we have a system or we have tools to collect the data and analyze it straight away, and uh, this is presented to, for decision maker to take uh, a decision. Artificial intelligence and cyber. So how can Industry 4 uh, uh, improve traditional working structure? So first of all, enhance, enhancing visibility of customers need and uh, needs the um, market segment to provide uh, accurate, high quality, personalized product and uh, service. Adoption of smart data analytics allow 
additional high margin revenue uh, when uh, customized products usually generate significantly higher margin than mass manufacturers wants. Example of this, if you want to go uh, and, and buy a car online, a new car, uh, you do not have uh, to have features you will not be using. Example, if you want to go to Mercedes and buy a car from Mercedes, and you, you don't think, and, and you will not maybe use uh, uh, pilot parking. I used to have Mercedes, which has a pilot parking, but I did not use it at all. It's a, it's a, it's a feature may cost me two, 3,000 pounds extra, and may cost the, the manufacturer a lot of work and effort. Uh, and I even will cost materials and, 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 and money. If I don't need it, they don't have to build it. I can go online and build my own car based on my own criteria so I can customize based on my uh, preferences. Okay, so, so they, they will be able to deliver uh, personalized solutions uh, for final users according to uh, their requirement as it's made by real-time data availability. Industry 4 offer a great opportunity, as I mentioned, for quality management in case of any failure, uh, since they immediately notify uh, the issue that uh, the responsible team or person, as I mentioned with the example of uh, uh, lorry broken down, uh, so we can take uh, 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 straight uh, reaction. Uh, now, increasing the number of smart uh, devices in the factory and the efficiency of the communication among them are favoring a global planet optimization that results in uh, industrial, I mean, increase of the industrial uh, productivity. So I don't have to waste uh, materials for a pilot parking if I don't need it, if I'm not gonna use it. This will also help uh, the environment in a, in, a, in, a, in a way. Because of improved automation, a lot of jobs will disappear. And this is a bit, uh, scary for most of the people when we talk about robots taking places in our um, uh, uh, in our factories and even in our businesses people are scared but i i think from my own perspective and from my own um, uh, observation uh, many many jobs will be uh, created as uh, per to the uh, this industrial um, era or industry for uh, revolution uh, now, example of this, uh, we have Volkswagen Industrial Cloud. So Volkswagen uh, implemented or enabled a smart real-time control. Uh, they implemented uh, what we call it Volkswagen Industrial Cloud. They implemented it in their manufacturing uh, and they, uh, they started collecting real-time information, uh, which bring uh, together data from all machines, plants, they, uh, or even branches all around the world and systems in all their factories. This enabled uh, Volkswagen or VW to analyze the process even much better and faster and those to become more uh, productive. The goal was to integrate the global supply chain for more than 30,000 locations and 1,500 partner companies into Volkswagen Industrial Cloud. So everyone involved in Volkswagen uh, manufacturing process, uh, distribution, distribution process, supply chain uh, uh, operation, they all uh, are connected to one cloud and they uh, automatically uh, provide real-time information about uh, businesses, about uh, uh, numbers, about uh, performance, and this uh, will, help, uh, uh, will help much better to, uh, to uh, uh, to, to, to improve the process and uh, uh, the communication. So for example, if a truck is about to get stuck in a traffic jam, a component uh, is faulty or a machine break down, as I mentioned, everyone involved knows immediately as information is uh, shared uh, uh, straight away uh, on the cloud. So the benefit of industry four, uh, just briefly, uh, it's uh, to provide continuous and timely communication between intelligent objects uh, by themselves and uh, people. It will give flexible production. It will give cost reduction. It will 
uh, help improving productivity and active uh, preventive uh, maintenance. Uh, active preventive, pre preventive maintenance when you have a sensor which can tell you that any part of machines or our vehicle will be will be shortly broken uh, will share shortly break down so you are aware uh, you can replace it or you can take action in advance so you don't have to wait uh, until uh, you are uh, uh, you are in trouble i have experience from one of my interviews uh, i uh, one of the big companies airplane uh, and, and luxurious car manufacturer. Uh, he, he was talking about the experience 10 years ago. Uh, there was a fault on one of the production line and they did not notice this fault. Uh, they were producing cars uh, on, the, on the car, uh, car line uh, production. And they were not aware of this fault and the car produced with a fault even they were not discovered. The, the, this fault was not discovered until like a few, maybe few months. They sold the car, uh, the car in use, and customers started complaining uh, about the, 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 the issue with the cars. So he was, he was discussing, he's from IT department in, in, in that company, and he was discussing if at that time, 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, if we had a kind of sensors, which is at least telling us that this part of the production line is faulty or there's an issue with it, we could have saved a million of pounds uh, and start of calling the cars again to the manufacturing uh, department and uh, trying to fix the issue and uh, putting our business in uh, big trouble. So now, you can have sensors which tell you which tell you that there, there's a fault could happen or there's a fault already happened in certain department so you are aware uh, uh, well in advance uh, instead of waiting until uh, the item is is, is uh, test or consumed by customer and you are notified by customers about this issue uh, monitoring is it's it's, it's, it's also help, uh, helpful for monitoring your production lines and to control uh, and for optimization. Optimization is, is one of the most important things. You do not have to produce a product, especially when you talk about cars or big products, you do not have to produce a product with features will not be uh, used. And real-time information uh, sharing. Now, there's a video, a three minutes video. I, uh, uh, it's just summarizing the, the, all what I discussed here. Uh, let me try to open it from YouTube and we, uh, we all watch it, if you don't mind. Can you hear it? The fourth we can't see it, you need to share the screen. Sorry? We, have, we still have the PowerPoint on. We need to, we don't see the video, we just see your PowerPoint. Okay, okay sorry, yeah. let me share the screen yeah. instead of sharing the slides. Yeah. Yeah, you need to minimize the size. Yeah. Just do you a new, a new share. Mm -hmm. New share, yeah. Yeah, that will be easier. And click on share uh, computer sound at the bottom. Uh, computer sound, share. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, because in, in Coventry, we use, uh, uh, we use the MS Teams uh, most of the time. So, um, yeah. Now should I have the chance to be part of yes, Just make it bigger. This yeah, isn't going yeah. to be like before. The fourth industrial revolution has begun, and you have the chance to be part of it. This isn't going to be like before. It's not about the steam that powered our factories in the first revolution, or the mass production model that dominated the second, or even the emergence of computer-driven systems from the third revolution that we're living in today. Industry 4.0 is about connectivity. It's an opportunity to radically change the way industry responds to the needs of society. As previous industrial revolution led innovations in manufacturing processes and systems, the advancement of Industry 4.0 will be driven by a smart, interconnected, pervasive environment. The opportunities for disruption are huge, and those left behind will feel it acutely. There is still space for leaders of this new revolution to emerge, but the race has already started. Understanding what current leaders are doing will help you join them. KPG.
formally examined what those trailblazers were doing in their factories and their offices, and it revealed some thought-provoking findings. Our research highlighted a number of areas that current Industry 4.0 leaders are focusing on. Leaders are planning ahead with clear strategic vision, driven by performance and tying investment to proven opportunities for growth, progress, and innovation. They are focused on discovering how smart products and processes can be developed. Integration is key. The major players are moving away from isolated silo-driven development, which limits scope and value of new projects. Instead, they are moving towards large-scale and proactive integration across their enterprise and among their customers, supply base, and products. To ensure they are aware of every possible opportunity Industry 4.0 technology has to offer. Perhaps most importantly, they are not afraid to think big and act bold. This means nurturing innovation, developing disruptive thought processes aimed at devastating the status quo, and looking for opportunity in every element of their value chain from which products are designed and how they are produced, to who they are sold to, how they are purchased. Your organization may be radically different in the future with a range of products, services, and processes you can't currently predict. Want to join the leaders of Industry 4.0? Can you afford not to? Then our advice is plan ahead. Fight radical change with integrated radical action. And embrace the fact that it's time for manufacturers to step up and start making smart, bold moves. If you don't, you could be left behind. You have this chance. Let us help you take it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all for me. Uh... Uh, I, I want to uh, to conclude with um, with asking you uh, to open the discussion. Uh, what's your expectation? Or what's your um, uh, view about the challenges challenges of uh, industry uh, four point uh, uh, zero? Thank you so much for listening, and I will leave it uh, to you now, guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, just to recap, uh, Dr. Awad gave us a brief introduction about the ontology engineering aspect, which is all to do with the knowledge acquisition and knowledge understanding and comprehension and how we process it. And Dr. Ahmed here took us to Industry Point Four, which is more of a, an application where you've highlighted the, some significant improvements in our society. So you started talking about uh, the network of things and how things are going to interact, the, the machinery. And this links in with the heart of artificial intelligence, because we said at the beginning, it's a part of computer science where we develop intelligent machines and we have been developing them over a four generation period. We're in generation three now where we looked at the active machines in terms of giving them some data, some knowledge like Dr. Rawat said, and we interpret that knowledge. And now we moved on to uh, the limited memory machinery where we started communicating in terms of uh, self-driving vehicles and other things like that. And now we're moving more into that social robotic elements of things where we're creating a theory of mind as the psychologists refer to it. And I think this is where your concept of uh, the, uh, the internet of things and the internet of people sit because we are moving away from just a machine that does a function as it was given to us by Dr. Awad to a machine that can communicate with another machine to form a culture, a group of cars behaving together, uh, reacting to each other. And the next stage or generation four after industry four is gonna be industry five where the machines actually are autonomous. They're gonna start taking the decisions or self-aware of themselves. And we're nowhere near that yet because we still wait for G5 and other things like that to help the transfer of the knowledge. But if we take a bigger picture before we move on to the next speaker, Dr. Rabi, uh, this is all tied in with what Deming said, the, in God we trust, but all others need to bring data and we need to understand the data, we need to quantify the data, we need to learn from the data. And I think this is where artificial intelligence comes into it. 
because its its ability to communicate and process and analyze and synthesize is beyond our comprehension. And this is clear from industry four how the new phase of civilization is going to be. We're moving on from the industrial revolution to the knowledge revolution, and now we're going beyond it to the application of knowledge, basically, and the processing of knowledge. And uh, it's it ties in with. But what Mather said earlier on in the 19th century about resources being limited, but human populations are expanding, and there's a deficit element there. But with through the industry four, through the knowledge management, through artificial intelligence, we have developed what this group has been trying to do: a sustainable future in terms of utilizing the resources in the smartest manner. And I think this is where your slide just before the video came into it, where you listed to us how industry four is going to be on-time communication, it's very flexible, it's uh, monitoring, there's productivity, it's big things being applied with minimum cost and minimum resources. And we should not fear this because although the landscape is changing for us, it's creating new jobs as old jobs will disappear. And this is apparent in all our civilization. I mean, a few years ago, if you told me I'll be having a conference in this manner, I wouldn't have believed you. And nowadays, you know, I'm talking to people from around the world here. So uh, what I'm saying here is a conclusion of what we said is we presented the knowledge and we presented an application of how this knowledge could be featured. And I think I have a question here from Dr. Amin who says, Dr. Ahmed, can you uh, employ knowledge management to the Internet of Things? Can you provide an example for that? Employing knowledge uh, to Internet of, uh, of Things. I mean, uh, if we say knowledge uh, is, uh, is, uh, is information about certain uh, certain scenario, yes, uh, it is uh, actually already employed. When 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 machine communicate with a human, when we talk about Internet of Things, uh, or a machine talk to a machine, uh, sorry, Internet of People, our machine communicate with machine Internet of uh, Things. Yes, it's 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 communicated. Uh, the communication is based on uh, knowledge. Based on information, so if the target, if the target, uh, uh, if the target for certain manufacturer to produce one hundred thousand item, okay, so uh, and the share for for two machines, let's say I'll make it simple, for two machines to make five hundred thousand uh, uh, item, okay, for certain reason one machine was a bit faster. Uh, we, I mean, without discussing the reason, one machine was faster and it was able to reach the 500,000. Other machine is, uh, uh, has only produced 400,000. We have 100,000 to be produced to achieve the target or to reach the target. This could be automatically. We don't need to get involved. Those two machines, automatically, they know that the target is, um, is uh, I said, one million, uh, half each, half million each, let's say. Uh, one of them finished, uh, the, finished uh, the share uh, so automatically can keep producing until the target is achieved for on both on both uh, uh, on both machines so uh, you see when they communicate they inform each other about their performance also okay so they achieve the target this is a very simple example of uh, how we uh, could use uh, knowledge but there are more complicated and uh, from my observation on 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 uh, as i mentioned i had them uh, uh, practical knowledge when I went to one of the manufacturer, car and airport manufacturer, uh, how they employ, and they are still, what they claim, they are still behind in terms of implementing Industry 4 or even understanding uh, the term Industry 4 or Big Data, Big Data Analytics. But yes, it is already implemented and it's already uh, uh, used. Thank you very much. There's a few more questions trickling around, but uh, can I ask everyone to put their cameras on because uh, the World Association wants to take a, a group picture as we normally do in a real conference, but we're going to do it virtually here. And uh, uh, well, there's a lot of questions, but I just wanted to ask one last question from, again, Dr. Amir, who's asking Dr. Ahmed about the network benefits and how because the network benefits be leveraged in terms of network for industry for. What exactly you mean by network benefit? Can you can you explain? 
I think he's talking about the limitation of the network or how can you optimize the network to actually apply the knowledge management system in the internet of people and the internet of things. Uh, Dr. Rawad, can you handle this because it's more into knowledge uh, management or more, it's more technical, I think. Yeah, of course, but if you can repeat the question, please, uh, Mohammed, please. It, it's on the discussion. It's about how do we leverage the network benefits in relationship to the Internet of Things and knowledge management. Um, I guess, yeah, the more important thing here is to get the more uh, realistic data from our network, if I uh, understand the question properly. And again, any kind of representation for the knowledge uh, need to understand the nature of data. So if it's just simple structure for the networks, bandwidth, the connectivity, and so on, that will be easily or fairly easy to, to, to model that presentation. Now, unfortunately, that's not true in most of our scenarios because we have a huge complexity now in capturing the networking issues, especially when we talk about IoT and smart cities, you will talk about different sources of data coming from different devices, and these devices, they have different types of connectivity. For example, your, your, um, your mobile, your handset, if you have um, connectivity with uh, what we call it when you open the internet from your um, hotspot, yeah, the hotspot, when you open the internet from your mobile and you can access through the uh, different devices, that hotspot has a certain range. Bluetooth has range different from Wi-Fi, different from other things. And nature of data that has been captured also is not valid for all the time. So this had a timestamp. So based on that, I guess you come up with analysis first and then you decide which best to which the, what is the best technique to model your knowledge. That, that's my quick answer for this. But again, this is a very big question that needs to be analyzed further, I guess. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. I think, I mean, it, it's very clear that networks are developing. We can see it every day in everyday faces where we have uh, the internet, we have the intranet internally, we have the VPNs and other localized networks. So as the internet of things and the internet of people develop, there is subcategories where the communication levels will go. They're apparent, they are protected, and there's different layers for it. And regarding to the bandwidth and other things like that, we can see the systems have been developed from uh, the first generations to the fifth generations being implemented nowadays. So the network does uh, expand itself. Uh, at this point, we're going to have a quick lunch break, unfortunately, because we're overrunning with time. We're going to have a 15 minute break, and I think we'll be back about 1.30 to actually listen to Dr. Rabi talking to us about the data sciences and representing elements of the data science. Dr. Alam, do you want to say a word before yeah, we go? Just a, just a question. We had these questions in the, in the social media uh, quite a lot. We actually been asked this question also before in different ways. People ask uh, because they like the, the, the sexy word of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. What are the, uh, if they want to study artificial intelligence, you both teach artificial intelligence in your universities. And I think maybe that can also elude it to Professor Joseph, the Dean from uh, Uganda. Uh, you know, students, do they, I know for data science, you need to have a good mathematics background. For data science, what backgrounds, what do students need to have, particularly for young generations? Do they have to come from a science background? Do they, anyone can study artificial intelligence? And also for all the people like us or those who already graduated, if they, if they want to have a course on artificial intelligence, is there any uh, basic requirement they have, they must, so they can actually listen to a complete course, and perhaps maybe Professor Jody from Uganda, do you teach, uh, not your department in particular, but if it's becoming a regular course, or maybe from Iraq, we can also hear, do data science, do you teach data science as a program like here in London or in the UK? So it's really more of, for all of you, really. Not really uh, as, uh, uh, as a handle-on program, uh, we really go into ICT and some of those uh, are provided as courses, not as programs. So they are courses of the programs. And the requirement is that um, we, somebody might have done some mathematics. But uh, in some other courses, which are uh, like information, you do not necessarily have to have done mathematics at A level. So that's the position. Yeah. And I would say the same thing here as well. Um, AI is a very broad uh, 
uh, broad term, so you can have uh, mathematical capabilities, good mathematical capabilities if you'd like to go to data science, more analytical and prescriptive thing, descriptive. But you can also study AI from, uh, from uh, ethical perspective as well, which does not require that kind of uh, huge uh, mathematics and huge scientific uh, background. Also, you can study AI for from a governmental, uh, so not government, from governance point of view, uh, rules and processes that need to be adopted in order to apply AI in societies. And this is also uh, more of business rather than technology. Uh, that's interdisciplinary approach, I think, is, is an advantage for all of us because we need to talk, talk more about AI, reach a common language where we need to start and investigate these issues in our society, within our society. It's completely, uh, I would say, significantly different from in Uganda, from UK and France and so on. So that's, I say, my, uh, my answer for this question. Can I also add, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm a chemical engineer and I do chemical and sustainable engineering, but we've uh, designed the new courses nowadays in terms of the application of engineering where we incorporated big data and artificial intelligence as an application or a tool to the sciences that we offer. So it's, you're not a specialized person in terms of uh, Dr. Rawabi, Dr. Ahmed in a specific area of the knowledge management and the artificial intelligence, but you're specializing in the linguistic and applications of the knowledge that you have, transferable knowledge from one discipline to use machine learning to then predict data, reduce times, meet the needs for the industry for and other things like that. So you can look at it from your own applications if you want to go into a master's level or you can do it from the undergraduate levels onwards. Yeah, from, from what I teach at uh, Coventry as well, uh, you need to have basic, uh, basic knowledge in statistic and quantitative approach. Uh, you, you, it doesn't have to be advanced knowledge, but in order to start with uh, data analytics uh, and big data analytics, uh, you, you need to have some uh, uh, quantitative approach uh, uh, knowledge and statistics, basic term of statistics. I, I hope this uh, helps. This in terms of business business perspective. Yes, I think because this question is being asked because we keep saying to people this is a, the new century is knowledge you have to the, the, the key sub subject now but it's good and just uh, in Iraq do you teach it, Victor Amir? Because you you teach knowledge management do you teach artificial yes. intelligence or yes. data science or? Yes, yes, sir, Professor uh, Alam. Uh, we have uh, knowledge management uh, course in uh, management information department. Uh, I teach for uh, M master students. Uh, I uh, teach about uh, uh, three decisions or uh, three analysis in statistics about AI. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, now we have a clear understanding of the different elements of it. I'm sure everyone's keen. Uh, let's take an interval. In the previous session, just before the lunch break, we talked about the knowledge management and we talked about the application of the knowledge management in terms of the industry for and what facilities it can bring to us here. And we're very grateful to have Dr. Rabi with us from the Informatic Systems in Cambridge. Uh, he's a lead data scientist. Is he going to talk to us about data sciences? And before I give him the platform, I just wanted to highlight a concept about data sciences is all about using algorithms and mathematics to actually enable the knowledge and give insight into the knowledge from structured and unstructured data here. And it's all about gathering the information of the data and then enabling the machine to process the data to come up with the decisions or the knowledge that we have here. Uh, if Dr. Rabia just permits me, I just want to highlight this element through uh, a quick kind of a slide. I don't know if you can see my slide. Okay, shall I stop? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Rabia. I was trying to highlight the image of data processing, but it kind of lost your, uh, your presentation in the meantime. Do you mind resharing your slides? Um, uh, okay, all right. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. We can see the slides now. Yeah. All right, uh, shall I start then? 
please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for the invitation, Professor Alain. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for the introduction. Um, yes. Um, today I will like talk about a sort of buzzword that is called data science, um, which is um, a, a trendy, let's say, a trendy field. Is not new, but we are talking about it too much um, the last, let's say, five five years. Uh, but because you know, when business and marketing is stepping into science, it starts creating terms uh, that are uh, a bit far off uh, being um, objective. So today, what I'm presenting is the basic or fundamental concepts that we need to understand and some sort of buzzwords that we need to um, to grasp and as well. Uh, it's an international trend, not only for research companies, but also for, for governments. Um, and actually there are so many countries in the, in the uh, five continents that started making their own strategies for the so-called industry uh, version four, including, I mean, which, co which comprises uh, data science, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see here, actually, I mean, a lot of countries started something. I mean, started, started a, um, a sort of um, vision um, to, to see how they can make this transformation uh, or um, uh, digging into this new era of, uh, of technologies. Even uh, African countries like, for example, Kenya here, I don't know if uh, I, you can see my arrow. Kenya started this in the, in the early uh, 2018, then, uh, then Tunisia, um, and so many countries started this. I mean, this is in terms of strategies, but also in terms of data. There is a, a platform or a program that is called the Open Government Partnership, which is um, a sort of platform helping governments to create better, let's say, better data. We'll see in the end of this presentation, what does it mean to have good data, actually? Um, I mean, let's say better data to, um, um, to facilitate accountability uh, sharing data, reusability, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see here, actually, still in Africa and Asia, I mean, of course, we understand why for China this is, this is not an option, because they prefer to have their own ecosystem. Um, but um, mainly uh, Europe and um, the uh, Americas are into this, either by development uh, developing action plans or even implementing action plans. I mean, and in Africa, I mean, there is again, uh, Kenya, Tunisia, Morocco. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, that, that, that started as well implementing action plans to make their data, let's say for now, better. All right. So let's start with some fundamentals first. So here we are talking about data science, which is supposed to be now the umbrella for so many other uh, buzzwords, including AI, machine learning, deep learning, big data, et cetera, et cetera. However, you can find so many, uh, so many, let's say, diagrams that are explaining somehow the relation between these different fields and, uh, and words. But let's, stay, let's start from the very, very beginning we are talking about data science. So let's start with, with, with data. And let's start maybe with some etymology that will make it maybe um, better to understand. So data actually is the plural of data. I know the term is not used in English anymore, but it used to be used. And it's coming from the verb Latin dare. Dari means give, all right? So basically data uh, or are, since it is plural, are 
provided things. We need to make, we don't need to make any effort to receive them, to perceive them, things that we can perceive. But for better, for better definition, it's an association between a thing, a thing, when I mean a thing, something that exists, all right, and a symbol. A symbol means something visual, so something we can see, something we can hear, something we can feel, something we can perceive in general and we can sense. So this is, so which means actually it, it is a form of virtuality that is, that could be perceived. Either, I mean, whether we could make an, a sense of it or not, it is something, it's a meaning, it's some sort of meaning. I mean, we could understand it or not, that is another story, but it's some sort of virtuality, some sort of meaning. And this thing started with when human could give names to things. When human actually started associating, let's say, a voice to an animal, because they can hear that the animal is making that, that sort of sound. Let's say calling a bird like cuckoo or something like that. And as you can see here in the picture, actually, it all started from human and then anything else is associated with it because we simply name things. And it seems to be a peculiarity for human, actually. And this is this is a huge, um, a huge step into civilization, and that that could maybe separate us from uh, the animal uh, kingdom. So whenever I see something, or I can perceive it, that's data for me. As soon as I can make sense of it, and it I can translate it in a form of news, it becomes information as you can see here information is simply a collection of data that can take the form of news let's say for example a exists or the population of the uk is i don't know 70 million uh, people right is something that could be true could be false or uh, could be true to some extent or could something that we can make a decision about and then if we go higher we can build knowledge and that is by associate associated um, sets of informations in a sort of causality or correlation let's say for example here if a exists then B exists as well. So you can translate it into a rule, which means, for example, when, and, and I say you can translate it, is, is, it doesn't always come in the form of a rule. Let's say, for example, magnets, uh, let's say, attract iron. This is a rule as well. Because you can say, if I have a magnet, I have a piece of iron, then there will be an attraction between them. So you can translate it. As you can see here, um, so the first step, the first level is data, then information, which is a collection of data, and then knowledge itself, which is collection of information linked with a causality or correlation uh, logic. Um, there is a process that allows us to generate more information. For example, for, for, for example, with this case, I know that A exists or exists. And I know as well that I have a rule saying if A exists, then I should expect B somewhere. And now I know that A exists. So I can infer simply that B exists as well. So this inference is when you mix here a piece of knowledge, a piece of information, you might get new information. 
all right? To summarize um, this, um, you can think of it in this form of taxonomy. You have a big circle of data. As soon as we can make some sense or we, and we can understand the meaning of some collections of them, we get into the blue circle of information. As soon as we can understand the mechanisms or the, the law or the rules that are governing relations between these pieces of information, we get into knowledge. All right? And of course, we can generate after that more blue uh, things, I mean, more, more information, I mean, using the inference process. So this is uh, data. Okay, and now, so we are in the topic of data science. So what is maybe data science? All right. So I will start maybe from, again, from the etymology of things. So we saw what data is in terms of etymology. It is something given, something we can perceive, some sort of virtuality. Science is from, uh, uh, scientia or scientia from, from Latin, and the verb is share, which means in English to know. Okay. And now data science is used as umbrella for all the terms that you would um, consider as technological new terms. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, uh, data analytics, uh, data mining, etc., etc. However, you can find some different Venn diagrams that overlap in the uh, overlap in these different terms together. But when you say data science, you could, if you have a data scientist or a team of data science, they are expected to work on all of these things. So what is it? And since we are talking about science. Here we are talking about objective methods, measurable methods, um, uh, something that is far away subjectivity and um, let's say um, personal opinions. And to do that, your team should be able to, to handle three things or what I like to call three languages. The language of the universe that is um, uh, comprising maths, statistics, etc. The language of machine, computer science, um, uh, software development, etc. And then the language of business. It could be biology, it could, could be journalism, it could be uh, politics, etc. Et um, handling these three languages or these three, uh, three sort of expertise um, it means that you can do data science. You can do data science, which means applying objective and scientific ways and methods to transform your data to good shapes and to extract insights and knowledge from them. Remember the knowledge? These piece or pieces of uh, insights that are some sort of rules explaining what is governing relationship between data. As you can see here, there are like binary intersections between um, each two fields. For example, if you do computer science development, etc., algorithmic and math, so you can be able to devise new machine learning methods. Um, Traditional uh, research is based on knowledge in a specific domain, as well as knowledge in statistics and maths. And of course, for software development, um, a software developer should know the minimum in the field where they should um, develop some sort of software. Okay. So what can we do? 
with data science? Why do we need that? I mean, basically for three main things. First, we can, we have three goals and two sort of actions we can, we can do. The most tyrant action is data transformation, what you can see here in, in red. And this is taken in the best cases or the worst cases, depends how you look at it. 50% of the effort, sometimes is 90% of the effort. When you need to transform your data, for example, you, you need to make a lot of transformation even before, for example, reaching some goal of, I want to know if this uh, customer would be solvable if I give them some loan or not. If this customer would buy something, there are plenty uh, and a huge amount of transformation that needs to be done for that. So this is the fastidious uh, uh, part of it. So data transformation is one of uh, two actions. The other one is knowledge discovery. And here, remember the term knowledge, because here in data transformation, what I'm doing, I'm taking data, which is set of information, and, and, and I'm transforming it into a different shape of information. But now what I'm doing is I'm extracting knowledge, not only bare uh, information or simple information, but knowledge. And that is the task of knowledge discovery, which could be done with machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. Why do we do this? For basically two things. And the third, that could be based on the two. So these two objectives are descriptive knowledge, which means I don't know what, what is my goal exactly, but I want to understand what is going on there. Let's say, for example, the distribution of age, the, dis the different um, uh, subgroups in some sort of community, the different communities that are uh, using, for example, uh, social media in a given country. I want to understand what is in there, which means I go from the level of the in, um, um, from um, uh, a particular person to something higher, to a group of people, from instance to a group of instances. That is the descriptive knowledge. The predictive knowledge is more granular, which means I want to label, to give a label or to predict a label to an individual. I want to know if they are left wing or right wing. I want to know if they will be solvable or not. I want to know if they are interested in this movie, in that product, etc., etc. Both for, I mean, both descriptive and predictive can allow people to to make prescriptive knowledge. And, and that is when you have, for example, a problem. So you do your descriptive knowledge, uh, descriptive work, predictive work, and then you want to resolve some sort of, for example, um, you want to predict areas where criminality, there is a high level of criminality there. And there, based on that, if you know, if you know the rules, because knowledge means models and rules if you know them so you can understand why the, there is a high level of criminality there so the prescription here is trying to uh, break or destroy the triggers of um, the thing i'm investigating all right so how can we extract knowledge and that is basically using the so-called artificial intelligence, um, which has as well three levels. The level of, let's say, classical artificial intelligence, which is uh, um, some sort of copy or fake copy of uh, the human behavior, which means <clears throat> uh, I have a seed of knowledge that I inject into a machine and then the machine should behave based on, on that. I have a seed of knowledge. 
without that, I can't start with it. All right. Let's say, for example, I have a machine that should um, uh, should should do some sort of action based on some sort of conditions, and that is why here I, I've written. Um, so you have seed of knowledge that is necessary, and from it, you can do you can generate new information here. K for knowledge, I for information. You can generate information. And when I say information, it could be an action as well, or a decision. I mean, information is the umbrella for action, decision, or some any, anything that could take the form of news. Or if I can do some reasoning, let's say uh, A implies B and B implies C, so I know that A implies C. So this is, this is the very classical artificial intelligence, all right, which requires an injection of a seed of knowledge, a set of rules. From that set of rules, more rules could be built and more information and decisions uh, could be built as well. Uh, I don't know how much time I have. Do I still have some time? Not, you still very... have 10, 10 minutes, roughly. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I still have 10 minutes. Sorry, yes, 10 minutes, just under 10 minutes. Okay, okay, yeah. So, um, and then machine learning. In machine learning, actually, we don't need to have any, any sort of um, initial knowledge. We don't need to have any sort of initial rules. We just need an algorithm that is external, and then I have a set of information. And then I generate models. All right. Deep learning is more specific because we don't even have sensible or meaningful information. We have only data and then information is built and then knowledge is built upon that is more specific. So what is what is big data? And I will I will try to, to do a quick here. Uh, Actually, you uh, maybe some of you heard of the three V's or the three dimensions of uh, big data. Uh, and they said that we can talk about big data when we have big volumes of data, uh, varied and complex structure and non-structure, etc. And um, it could have two forms of velocity. It could come in form of batch or in form of, of streaming. And Okay, three dimensions, they all start with V. What a coincidence, actually. Though this is okay, but some other people want to, to be more in, innovative. So they said, oh, okay, let's add veracity. So it's not three V, so it's, it's four V then. And veracity is how accurate the data is. Uh, it seems like here, a bottle of V. <laughs> So we are getting into, into this kind of um, pseudoscience that is more about impressing how I can express things. And of course, you know the rest, or maybe not. Then we have five Vs, six Vs, seven, eight, and now we have 16 Vs. And guess what? They are all Vs. You know, actually, uh, uh, viscosity, uh, visualization, ver oh, come on. In the end, in the end, what is there? What is, what can we get from this uh, buzzword? We don't need to care about these bits. We got some sort of idea. It's simply maybe this. Big data are data that have a scale, diversity and complexity that require, require new approaches, in, in new hardware. This is it. It's something that is bigger than my capacity or my, the capacity or of my facilities to handle it. And now, when talking about big data, we are talking more of uh, technologies or new approaches that are handling these data rather than describing how the data should be and the different Vs of these data. And just to give an example, Hadoop ecosystem, is the most adopted um, stack or package of big data technologies that is uh, widely used uh, now. 
data and decision. I'm going to be quick. There are so different ways to take decision. Using democracy, using dictatorship, using balance, using based on your finance, uh, asking customers, etc., etc. But we always find people like this. These gods of knowledge, they know, they know they're right, okay? And uh, you, it's better to not argue with them, but you will find as well other people like this, this wise man who said without data, you are just another person with an opinion. And this is it actually, this is the point. To be just here to introduce the term of being data driven, I make my decisions based on data, that's it. It's not a question of ego, but somebody else made it more, uh, made a good compromise maybe. If we have data, and this is one of the former uh, CEO of Netscape, he said, if we have data, so let's look at the data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. Okay. <laughs> so maybe it's, it's a good way as well to do things. In the end, how to be data driven because you will find so many things that are saying okay this is data driven company etc this is data driven so what is that basically people who do the sales don't know what what what, what being data driven is it is simply this analyzing data getting insights from data taking action on the light of these insights and then there's something very important here. I need, I need to have a trace. My action sh and my decision should generate new data. And then I go and I make my loop. And this loop will always um, get better with better insights, with better decision, etc. Like a baby learning. This is being data driven. Uh, I will finish with this. If we, want, if we need to, to be data-driven, we need to make things digital. And we need, we need to dig and dive into digitalization. And I will speak here about the third principle of data management. So maybe, I mean, in, there, is, there are three terms that are used interchangeably in this, in this, in this um, concept of uh, digitalization, which is digitalization, digitalization, and digital transformation. The first one is making, is the process of making data in digital format. The second one, which is digitalization, is making processes digitalized and smarter, like using artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So the first one is about data. The second one is about processes. The third one is about the business itself. Does the business, um, is it using data and technology to sell, to get feedback, et cetera, et cetera. But because I said here, where should we start? We should start here in digitization thing. How can we transform data into digital format what form how and for this we need to use the fair princi principles and this is a concept that appeared in the scientific community actually and it stands for findable accessible interoperable reusable all right uh, but then it got into business and etc and even actually people are not still familiar with this with this uh, concept or these principles because for example here even in research they asked um, 750 researchers and only like 150 of them are familiar with the concept um, so let's get into it and remember in the beginning I said that that platform OGP that is helping government to create better data for more accountability and more efficiency. Here we need to separate between two things. When we say fair, that doesn't mean open. Of course, 
if data is uh, data are open and fair this would be very very nice but data could be fair and not open could be open and not fair and could be both and could be neither fair and neither open all right um still what is fair okay i'm coming to it <laughs> is here so findable accessible interoperable reusable findable means that each entity each data point should have an id, an ID. this this data thing could be a code could be a client could be whatever but it must have an id at least accessible there must be a protocol that is used so I can get this from its rep repository. It's, it's accessible. And then inter uh, 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 inter interoperable means that it has a format that is a standard. It is in Excel, JSON, CSV, but not Word and Excel and these kind of vendor uh, format. And then reusable is simply with all three first uh, findable accessible interoperable and with extra and and more uh, metadata and description here maybe you can see the colors actually colors are meaningful here because yellow means uh, metadata um, this burgundy uh, burgundy thing here is about protocols the red is about format so is making data well structured with IDs uh, in good format, standard format, accessible via like normal uh, protocols like internet, etc., and in the end, richly described. So this is good data. So there is a process to do this, but I will skip it for the time. But I will finish with this, which I just said. In the end, getting into digital and getting good data so that you can make the best of data science is to create objects, data objects like this. So if you see here in the kernel, you have the data, the digital object itself. It could be data, code, or whatever things, any sort of data. They all should have identifiers. They all should have, should be in standard format. And in the end, richly described uh, like I, I just give an example. For example, the ID is um, is um, uh, I don't know a string of uh, fifteen characters, and it starts with and it has this the expression. So that is some sort of metadata. If we have this, we get good data, easily transformable, easily reusable in so many cases. Thank you very much, Dr. Rabia. That was very insightful in terms of uh, data sciences and the, you've linked it to the previous sessions in terms of industrial four, and then you mentioned about the government operational processes, which was quite interesting. And then uh, you actually helped us link between uh, the knowledge element and the information and the data. And that was very important for us to distinguish between these three layers to then start looking at the business elements, the math elements, and the computer elements, and how the different uh, facts of life or different trades will have their own languages in terms of universal languages for mathematics or machine learning for the computers. And then there's the business terminologies that we have to encompass in everything else. And that brought us into analyzing this sum of data in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of machine learning, in terms of deep learning, and what does each one of these concepts mean to us here? And then you gave us the concept of the Vs that kept growing from 1 to 4 to 5 to 8 to 16, I think was the last one you left us with. And then you gave us a, a link between data, insight, and action, which links into what we were trying to do in terms of the knowledge and in terms of industrial four earlier on here. And then you gave us the three Ds in terms of digital, digitizing, digitalizing, and data uh, infrastructure and analysis. And then you brought us into the FAIR model and how the FAIR model can encompass all the elements in terms of what is the data, what is the quality of the data, uh, is it structured, is it unstructured, how we use it and how we apply it. And it's been very, very insightful for us to actually get to know what we talk about when we mean data. Because all of us kind of think, you know, we use data, 
real life, but you've actually brought it home to actually give us an understanding. And uh, I'm getting an array of questions popping in through here, okay? Uh, can you give more light on the difference between digitizing and digitalizing, please? Okay, so actually digitizing is related to data itself, and that is the last part and the part that where uh, I, I focused more on how we do it, is focused on data itself how we can, um, um, is the overhaul or the recast of data um, to make it like um, easily reusable. Ref, um, uh, is is the, the process of refining data to make it ready to use with the less of transformation later on if I want to do something. So it's focused on data. Digitalization is more focused on processes, which means if I want to predict something, if I want to predict an association between, for example, um, a, a problem, okay, and uh, some category of people, what sort of algorithm should I, should I use? So is making this, um, let's say, based on machine learning and data-driven in a way, each time, I try to make, to get this insight. I need as well to measure how wrong was I, my error rate, and then go back and refine it. It's about the process itself, how to get insights from the data that was previously digitized. So it's about the process itself. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's a message here from Dr. Alam, but I don't understand it about a few time. Can you elaborate on that, Dr. Alam? You're muted, Dr. Alam. No, 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 sorry. Uh, this is a message actually from Professor Joseph Natai from Uganda. He is going to leave us shortly because of the care view of the timing, you know, because of the time different. So okay. I just suggested to give him uh, one or two minutes just to say a concluding remark. He has, you have been, Professor, an outstanding uh, contributor to this conference yesterday, your talk, your continuous discussions throughout the conference has been amazing. So I think if with, uh, with your permission, the moderator, if you give Professor Joseph just a few minutes to, to say a few remarks before he leaves, because uh, I think you have to leave, otherwise you'll be locked in the university. <laughs> Please go ahead, Dr. Joseph. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, yeah, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm Ahmed, uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to join you uh, in this conference and also uh, to be able to uh, make some few remarks uh, related to the subject that I presented yesterday. And for me, I must say it's an honor, and it's uh, really an honor that you take lightly, uh, but still, in the beginning, you and attending uh, more of these conferences uh, whenever you organize them. And uh, I'm, I really want to make uh, many new friends and collaborate uh, in the various areas of research that we are undertaking to be able to uh, contribute to this project. And like, thank you very much for extending the Thank you, thank thank you. Professor. Thank you very much. And we've really been very pleased. And uh, we will continue, definitely, we'll come back to our. I, I have always uh, said this before. Uh, many times I said, I gave you, even I gave you two days ago as an example to the Sudan Ministry of Higher Education, as uh, distinguished academics in Africa working very hard, not just to write papers or teach students, but to get engaged. And I think you have been very much engaging, and I really hope we have lots of uh, aspirations for your engagement in the future. Thank you very much, and I wish you and all the people in Uganda uh, all the best. I hope we all get out of this uh, COVID uh, safely. And thank you very much for your contribution. So the chair is back to you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you, Professor Joseph, for all your contribution. Uh, coming back to Dr. Rabi, can you give us an insight uh, from the data science point of view about structured and unstructured data? All right. Uh, basically, actually, um, talking about um, um, structure is is um, 
we can take two things, two references. Let's take the machine and the human, all right? When we get closer to the machine, data becomes more and more structured, simply because I can create any program to read the data. So this is the point. When it gets closer to human, that's a big mess. So we get free text of all sorts of things. And actually, um, I've been working um, in one of the field, I mean, in, in um, or let's say on biology uh, data, and I can't tell you is, is, is a suffering. Because biologists, for example, like to write, let's say, uh, gene functions and etc. in their own way. And everyone has this sort of ego to not change the way they, <laughs> they describe the function. <laughs> of course, the community in the end try to resolve this battle by creating some sort of uh, vocabulary, standard vocabulary, which make, would make uh, data get closer to the structure format. But still, in, in, very other, in, in many other areas, data is still free text. We like to express things in our ways. And if, for example, we see when people use a lot of adjectives and, uh, and these kind of, uh, I don't know how, how is it called in, in English, but the style of expressions. Ah, I don't know if this, the term is correct in English. These kind of style of expressions to say things. Yeah, but sorry, the machine doesn't care about that. So when we have that, we are talking about unstructured data. We don't have data points, and each data point has a given number of, or a known number of attributes and criteria. So yeah, so this is, uh, this is it, actually. Yeah, it's very fascinating, because there's all elements to do with the data, even uh, uh, the quality of data that you have, I'm sure, has an impact on it because not all data is relevant data. So I'm sure, as all of us will say to our students when it comes to simulation and other things, what you put in is what you get out of it. Does it mean it's the valid information? Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> but, yeah, I didn't want to say it because of the platform here, but yeah, rubbish in, rubbish out, basically. I say it to all my students on all simulation. Unfortunately, you know, you need to analyze the source of data when you're talking about the data the value of information of the data is very important and when you have a technical element a financial commerce element associated with this uh, element if you don't get the data right what you predict is a false model that's based on a false economy of scales and false predictions which means a failure of your phd uh, if you want to call it that basically Absolutely, so, yeah. So it, it's very important to analyze these things here. And we, we try to drive the point home in terms of, it's not just the data, it's about refining the data, it's about iterating the data, there's the statistical knowledge, there's the R values and other things like that. They're all the universal languages that you've talked about. And then you start moving it towards the assemble model, or in our cases, we move it towards the uh, governing principles in terms of this pressure volume and temperature as a basic entity, and then we build up into it. And as you said, a biologist point of view and a chemical engineer point of view, we have our own language that we describe things to. And unfortunately, the machine doesn't recognize these languages for us or the abbreviation. So it's training the machine and training and developing the unified vocabulary to refine the data to then to analyze the system is very important. Actually, um, um, for anecdote, actually, I, I had a little argument with the, one of the chancellor of the, um, uh, let's say, prime minister, Prime Ministry in, 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 uh, in Tunisia because they are trying to create a system to track all sort of, uh, let's say, uh, all sort of uh, money flows and if there are corruptions and stuff. Uh, the thing is that I asked them that there are some texts, some legal texts, for us to get knowledge from them, we need to, to force some sort of format for that. And she said, no, but the way of writing these legal texts is an art. We are not given this. Yeah, but I told her the machine doesn't care about art. We can yeah. put that in the video, but not, <laughs> we cannot give this to the machine, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, so it's, 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 it's as well a battle of making people understand this. Because I understand why people don't like this sort of dry, uh, 
information without soul, as they say and stuff. Yeah. You need some in I mean some some let's say spell of of art or uh, yeah you know. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate that. I mean, from the data point of view, that this is what we were trying to do throughout this session when we talked about it from Deming saying, in God we trust, but all others must bring data to them, to then trying to link it to the sustainability and other things like that. When we define the knowledge management aspects and what is knowledge in terms of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rawad's uh, presentation, and then we took it to Dr. Ahmed's presentation in terms of the application with the Internet of Things and the Internet of People and how everything integrates, we realized that the value of data is very important, the value of information and the data shared. If we're moving this artificial intelligence from a simple calculator, you put an input, you get an output to uh, a group of autonomous vehicles communicating with each other to then, um, you know, a psychology kind of behavioral organizational system as we're trying to do with the industry for to move to then a self-recognizing, self-governing IT or artificial intelligence systems that behave or mimic a human is very important to refine the data. It's very important to realize that there's a limitation and the data always controls everything. So at this point, I really thank you very much. It's been fascinating to listen to all of you in terms of uh, the knowledge, the industry applications and uh, uh, you've enlightened us in terms of what is data science is in a broader sense today. And thank you very much. And I hope you can share your PowerPoint presentation with us at some stage or another. So uh, at this point, I think the workshop in terms of the knowledge management, the data sciences uh, has concluded. Just and to give you a clap. Yeah, thank you very much to everyone who participated, Dr. Rabir, Dr. Ahmed, and Dr. Rawad here. And uh, I think from now on, we can move on to Dr. Mohammed al Hajj, who's going to talk to us about the actual case studies now of how these different types of knowledges can integrate with each other. So, without further ado, I'll give you Dr. Mohammed al Hajj, who will give us a, an industrial viewpoint of these applications. You're muted still, Dr. Mohammed. I can see your presentation, but you're still muted. Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. So thanks everyone uh, uh, for the opportunity, uh, and you know thanks for the presenters and you know for the organizers as well. Uh, um, so ba basically, you know, I'm, I'm probably just gonna approach uh, uh, the, 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 the topic, uh, you know, probably more from sort of like commercial, uh, uh, you know, corporate side. Uh, uh, the topic to, uh, of, uh, of the discussion in, in, in uh, it is uh, the strategic alignment and digital transformation enablers. Um, it is basically more focused on, 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 on strategic alignment generally. Uh, uh, as we go through, uh, you know, I mean, the, the word strategy uh, is, is used literally everywhere. Uh, you know, whether, you know, we talking about NGOs, corporate, uh, you know, world, uh, you know, education entities. Um, and there is so much, you know, fuzzy words, uh, models, and, and, uh, and the rest of it. And uh, uh, many leaders, and, and, and in fact, you know, uh, uh, it extends also to, you know, many of the policymakers, uh, they tend to get lost uh, within the jargons of, 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 of the various words. And they really, uh, I mean, the, the discipline itself, uh, uh, as, 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 you know, as one of the core management disciplines, uh, has evolved over the years into a number of sub-disciplines. Uh, then, you know, uh, you start to get, uh, or, or you see some organizations, you know, where they focus so much on the balance of scorecard. Uh, and, you know, and it just become the thing for that point of view, or, you know, or the KPIs. Uh, or you know the PMOs, or you know like you know putting liens and 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 the rest of it. So hopefully, what I'm gonna be trying to to to, to deliver today is uh, 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 a simplified view of of uh, of what's really the critical element when it comes to uh, a strategy, and 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 how that strategy a strategy can be uh, translated into actual actions. Uh, in uh, you know in, 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 in a corporate basically or, 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 or any organization of any kind 
uh, and, and this is not just limited to the organizations, you know, I mean, the, the concept and the principles, you know, it can be applied literally, you know, within any, you know, I mean, even at your home, you can apply the same uh, uh, sort of, uh, of, of guiding principles. Um, so uh, what I'm going to start with is, is, is you know, uh, just want to really uh, simplify our understanding of strategy. So uh, strategy itself uh, started as, 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 uh, uh, as a military uh, discipline. I mean, the military, uh, 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 just with the nature, you know, you know, we have the soldiers, we have the officers, and, you know, and we have you know, the overall leaders, you know, with the various ranking and the rest of it. Uh, they needed uh, some sort of, let's say, frameworks to operate and, 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 and work together and, 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 and achieve the, you know, the various uh, uh, vision and, 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 and uh, an objective that, 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 that they have. So uh, uh, military uh, as, as, as a discipline, you know, contributed hugely to the topic of the strategy. Uh, you know, the, the word strategy itself, you know, has a Greek origin, uh, which is uh, strategia. Uh, and uh, uh, as a management discipline, it started, you know, at the early 20th century, and it used to know initially as the business policy. You know, th this is literally, you know, just once things translated, you know, from moving from uh, uh, having this as 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 a, as a military discipline, you know, moving to the management discipline and and, uh, and the rest of it. So, uh, in, in very simple terms, uh, uh, the strategy is something that should help us uh, to move from where we are right now uh, to where we want to be uh, in the future. And that future could be in a year time, couple of years, uh, five years, 10 years, and so on, and, 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 uh, and so forth. Uh, so, it is really a map, you know, uh, and that map has uh, a very uh, critical importance because uh, we see some organizations, uh, the way they treat this map, uh, you know, uh, that it enables them to make things happen. So there is organization that make things happen. Uh, there is some organizations uh, who watch uh, things uh, happening, then they react to it. And there is other organization who really wonder what happens. Uh, you know, you know, it is quite obvious that, you know, uh, the majority of the organization, they really want to be at, uh, uh, you know, driving things and making things happening, you know, uh, and cascading those activities and the rest of it, you know, uh, you know throughout the organization. Uh, so to make things happen, there is uh, a few critical, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, culture and, and, and other attributes within the organization that need to, 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 to be embedded. Uh, obviously within the leadership, but it's also something that get cascaded down to, to, to the various workforce. So the ability to see opportunities, it is very, very critical. Uh, you know, having clarity on, 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 on the direction. Um, and you know, uh, you see this in, 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 in many, uh, uh, organization both you know in, in 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 the west as well as as in the developing world um where uh, people just go every day they turn up to work and they just you know do things you know uh and uh in many cases you know you stop an individual and it's like you know why are you doing this uh or you know why are you doing things the way you are doing uh and you know you would be surprised with the percentage of individuals that you know they just wouldn't really have a clear answer. You know um, why are they doing what are they doing? Uh, the ability to analyze, you know, what's happening externally outside the organization. You know, uh, it is something quite critical. Uh, I mean, we see now uh, as an example of that. You know, with COVID, uh, many organizations, you know, try to. Uh, uh, really respond to that, you know, so they've looked at the external environment, uh, the new world uh, with COVID is completely different than what is, 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 is happening before COVID. Uh, you know, the conference we have right now, you know, with the level of engagement, uh, this is something uh, which is probably um, would have been a little bit hard to imagine uh, that you, know, you could really have something as successful as this in, 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 in you know, while working remotely. 
uh, you know, we see so many consulting organizations right now, they have like, you know, uh, COVID offering, you know, to enable remote working, uh, uh, you know, time management, uh, uh, remote assessments of individuals and the rest of it. Uh, so, you know, the ability to really, you know, touch and sense what's really happening outside your organizations and how that can impact uh, the organization and then use that as an input uh, to uh, drive the way you do things. Uh, that's quite critical. Uh, then there is, you know, the various things like, you know, uh, uh, the ability to, you know, solve problems, you know, uh, the ongoing planning and the update of those planning based on the various uh, elements and, you know, being able to really, you know, rapidly adjust the way you do things. Uh, and obviously, uh, the ongoing uh, implementation uh, of, of, of what has been planned uh, and really having that culture of, of accountability. Uh, so, you know, uh, organization where, you know, um, uh, everyone really uh, is focusing not, getting, not to get into troubles. You know, normally the overall performance is not really that great uh, uh, where leaders, uh, you know, use uh, some of their direct, uh, employees and, 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 and you know and or, or, or even you know other stakeholders outside the organization as a scapegoats and things like that uh, normally the, 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 you know this organization who cannot really perform so really uh, 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 the, the stronger are the organization in these points the better they are positioned to uh, implement uh, and, 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 and uh, deliver strategy. So we've came up with very uh, specific, you know, like very, very simple uh, framework that, you know, we use throughout our engagement with, with, with clients where, uh, you know, we talk about strategy in terms of, you know, so, you know, a strategy, you know, it goes through the various phases. Um, uh, we start with developing the strategy. So that's something that needs to be done. Then, uh, we take that strategy and we translate it into something that meaningful and digestible to the organization in, 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 in the various areas. Then uh, there is a phase of really aligning the various components of the organization with, uh, with that translated strategy. Uh, and from that point, literally, uh, just going and, 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 and doing the planning and so on and so forth. So to develop a strategy, and I'm not going to spend so much time on this. Uh, there is uh, this planning cycle uh, that uh, really critical to do. So, uh, which is again, it, it talks to some of the point that I was talking about earlier. So, you know, the ability to analyze the environment and probably you guys heard about, you know, things like SWAT and Pistol and, and you know, the various business models and, you know, doing interviews, surveys and things like that. All of this is literally... Uh, just going through and doing an analysis of the uh, 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 environment, you know, both internally and externally. Uh, then there is some strategy fundamental. Uh, mission, values, vision is what people think about all the time, but it's, it's literally, it is just a bridge. Uh, it is a bridge uh, to go and set some sort of like initial blueprint on uh, to basically answer, you know, the very key two questions, you know, uh, what do we want to do and how are we going to do it? Uh, then there is, uh, uh, as you go and develop, there is things like strategic themes, uh, which is, you know, the key areas of focus across the organization, you know, uh, the change agenda uh, and how that's supported by the leadership uh, and how that also, you know, uh, supports some of the strategic uh, aspirations. Um, and you see all this all the time, uh, very clear on organization who achieved major transformation. Uh, there is always really strong strategic aspirations that cascaded throughout the organization. Uh, then it come, the next stage after that is actually the translation itself, you know, where you know, we write about the objective, we do the KPIs and, 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 and you know, we do the planning and the rest of it. Uh, and the cycle continues. So. Some organizations uh, 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 do this every five years. Uh, some of them, they do every 10 years. You know, some organization, they have a yearly planning cycle where they actually uh, revisit 
uh, uh, you know, this cycle, but literally, you know, this is the overall strategic planning cycle. Uh, moving from that, uh, it comes to the, you know, how we translate strategy uh, into, into, you know, an actual actionable items throughout the organization. And, and this is normally the stage where many organizations fail. Uh, so, you know, you've got, you know, uh, you know, leaders with policymakers, you know, they will come and, you know, they will bring, you know, McKinsey or, you know, uh, the, the like, uh, Booze or, you know, some of these, you know, big strategy house, and they will come and they will, you know, draw a very nice uh, strategy map. Uh, they will hand it over. Uh, and when it comes to actually translating that strategy into actual actions, normally uh, this is the area where things can be quite challenging. So if you look at the triangle we have right now, at the very top, you know, there is the aspirational side of things. And at the bottom, we have the tangible in terms of what can be achieved. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the main reason for the majority of the failures uh, uh, in transformation uh, generally is, you know, the, 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 the fact that, you know, everyone is focusing on, on, on the top side of the pyramids. Uh, and the more you go down, the further you go down, uh, is, the, is the area where there is literally, there isn't that much focus because um, that's literally when you do the hard job. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, on things like, uh, you know, uh, vision and mission, uh, there is um, lots of bad practices. In fact, you know, even across the consulting. So for example, um, it is quite common that people will come up with vision in terms of, you know, we want to be the best organization to deliver so-and-so. Uh, then they have the mission, which is, you know, what do we do? You know, and, and, and ideally, uh, when you work with a strategy, the very first thing you should do is work out your mission, not your vision. The reason being is the mission is why, is the reason why do you exist as a business, you know, or as an organization, you know? So, uh, if we are into car making, you know, our mission, you know, will be, you know, building a car, you know, the vision might be, you know, being number one, you know, car manufacturer in whatever discipline, you know, so uh, you cannot really set the, the target before you are really clear about what you're going to do as the business. The thing get translated to objectives and, 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 and the rest of it. Uh, so mission is the key and the key, the key, the most important element to have a, a good mission statement is to have a very, very simple mission statement. So um, the majority of, of, let's say, you know, you know like FTSE 200, uh, FTSE 100 or FTSE 500 in, the, in, the, in sort of like the US, um, these successful big organizations, they have normally very, very simple mission statements. So if you look at Google, you know, their mission is to organize the world information and make it universally accessible and useful. It's as simple as that. Yes, you know, Google has all these apps and, you know, they have so many ventures in so many areas, but literally that's their mission, as simple as this. <clears throat> uh, LinkedIn, you know, they want to connect the world professionals. Uh, you know, and make them more productive and successful. eBay, to be the world's favorite destination for discovering great value and unique selection. Uh, PepsiCo, you know, with all the byproduct that they, 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 they have, you know, across uh, not just the drinks and, you know, all the other, you know, um, uh, uh, product and even services right now across uh, food and privileges, uh, to create more smiles with every sip and every bite. Very, very simple, you know. Uh, Sony, you know, the same, you know, uh, a company that inspires to fulfill your curiosity. Microsoft, you know, it is to empower every person and organization uh, on the planet to achieve more, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are very, very good mission statements for, you know, uh, organization who's doing very well. Um, you could, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to give uh, uh, examples of some of the bad ones, uh, uh, but, you know, in, in the developing world, 
especially, you go and you look at the mission statement in, you know, for um, some of those organizations, and it is really complex, lengthy, and it really doesn't help everyone to, you know, work and, 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 and think in the same uh, manner. So simplicity uh, is a key. Uh, balance scorecard is a framework uh, to form a strategy. Uh, it, it is the most, uh, let's say, famous framework, uh, but it's not the only framework uh, that's there. And it, is, it can be quite good uh, if you developing and working and implementing that strategy for commercial you know, organizations. But for example, uh, uh, if you're working, for example, if you're building an, a strategy or you're uh, executing a strategy for an, an NGO, you know, the financial side might not be very strong. So it is good, but, you know, we just need to treat it carefully. Uh, uh, and, and, and one of the key things about strategy is really to have a governance framework around the strategy. And, and what that governance framework does, uh, it makes sure that... Uh, there is standards and there is measures and there is tools uh, across the organization at the various levels, you know, from the leadership all the way to the individuals uh, where everything is linked together. Uh, uh, the organization is being driven as a single vehicle, you know, with a single focus uh, and so on and so forth. So aligning the organization uh, to deliver the strategy, normally there is various elements. So uh, once we have a strategy, uh, to really implement a strategy, you can do two things uh, in an organization. You, know, you could either be running initiatives or projects, or you could be uh, doing things on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, as part of your business as usual. So literally looking at, the, uh, at those uh, uh, elements of the strategy, uh, which can be translated to projects. So, for example, you know, we are building a new system. Uh, we are merging, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain departments together. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, moving a headquarter from one place to another place. Uh, and literally any other project that can uh, help to achieve the overall, uh, you know, uh, vision and mission of the organization. Uh, the other executing vehicle for that is the business as usual. So between projects and business as usual, these are the two things uh, that organization need to think about, you know, when it comes to how they would execute the strategy. Okay. Uh, and, and normally, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's the point where things can fail. So, you know, not picking up the right project to fulfill the strategy uh, and not uh, change the uh, business as usual in terms of, you know, the processes, the policies, the procedures, uh, you know, and even the systems is being used and so on uh, uh, to, 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 to fulfill that strategy. That's another uh, area where uh, if we didn't get it right, you know, normally the, the achievement of the strategy can be quite challenging. So planning is a good thing. Uh, uh, yearly planning. Is, 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 is what uh, good, good organizations tend to do. So basically they go back and they look at the corporate strategy and they look at the operational plan for the two or three years. Then they, every year, they go and basically redefine what are they doing, you know, in terms of uh, 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 cascading of those operational plans to the individual departments, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, they develop it further, they validate it, and they go through the cycle again, you know. So a good organization, literally, they do this, uh, this on a on, 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 on yearly basis. Uh, another touch on, 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 uh, on uh, aligning the strategy. Uh, so, you know, uh, having, you know, some sort of PMO, project management office, that can look at the various projects, making sure they still fulfill those strategic objectives and so on is, is, is quite critical. Having a framework to deliver that is, 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 is quite critical as well. Uh, and the very critical thing is literally to use the strategy to drive decision making, okay? And that decision, uh, you know, across the various levels. So, you know, uh, initially, 
you know, we have those three, three levels. You know, we have a corporate strategy and some business plans. There is some sort of approved budgets and there is some sort of like initiatives and, 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 and so on. And literally decisions at all levels should be driven by the strategy, you know, or by the element that cascaded from the strategy. So uh, as a leader, uh, if there is, uh, you know, an investment decision you need to make, you know, there is two competing initiatives, you know, you should really go back and test those two initiatives in terms of, you know, uh, priority wise, uh, which one is needed before the other one, but also uh, if you test them against the various strategic builders that you have, you know, which one is, is really supporting your strategy more than, than, the, uh, than, the, other, uh, uh, than the other one. So uh, using a strategy to drive decision making across the organization at all levels is quite critical as well. Uh, then planning operations. So uh, any operation, uh, 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 for it to work, there is number of business processes that normally, you know, uh, might have, you know, different level of maturity depending on the organizations. Um, they will be organizational structure, you know, that can change and adapt and so on. There is some technology element and there is data and information element as well. And there is some services. So literally all these, uh, uh, if we call it, you know, organizational facets, uh, they need to be connected together. The business processes should be driven by the strategy uh, and the way the organization is structured. Uh, it should work around how we can optimize the delivery of those business processes. Um, when we implement technologies, uh, those technologies should be designed on the basis of how those business processes uh, are, uh, you know, being gathered and formed and optimized and so on. Uh, when we look at data and information, uh, I know my colleagues, you know, probably touched into this in way more deeper, but in, you know, for us in, 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 in very high level, you know, uh, what data and data clusters uh, that we have uh, across the organization, you know, uh, what standards that's being used, you know, for information classifications, for security, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, the other element to really realize that strategy as well is, you know, is literally uh, the way we design our business processes uh, to use all the inputs in terms of, you know, uh, what are the quality criteria, uh, what are the strategic context, you know, what the market imperatives and, 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 uh, and so on and so forth. And at the end, you know, really having things integrated together. Uh, so, you know, what the finance team is doing versus uh, what the procurement uh, team are doing, you know, it needs to gel uh, together. Uh, the way the HR manager uh, is hiring resources uh, it really need to support the, 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 the overall uh, strategy of the organization. Uh, uh, the way, uh, you know, your procurement function operate. I mean, like uh, as an example, um, uh, I had one client recently uh, where the procurement manager was really, you know, like the personality of that individual was like really, really sort of like, you know, driver and strong and the rest of it. Um, uh, but he was not really supporting the core business. So, you know, he wanted to do things in a way uh, which uh, he felt it's best practice. Uh, you know, uh, it make that department shine, uh, but it doesn't really support the core business. And, 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 and this is really due to the lack of uh, common strategy, common goals, uh, and common framework of, of, of developing, uh, delivering, and cascading that, uh, that strategy. I'm going to jump on that one. Okay. The, the, the final uh, areas uh, on the strategy is the ability to monitor the performance on the, of the strategy on the various levels as well. You know, so uh, really uh, having um, uh, uh, a, f a performance management framework, which is measure things at various level, you know. So if you look at the left-hand side there, you know, this is, you know, just an example, you know. 
uh, we have sort of, sort of like, you know, like, let's say on a government level, there, there was a number of uh, strategy uh, drivers. Uh, then we have an example, a minister of education, um, you know, they really needed to look at those government uh, 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 strategic drivers and use it to form its own drivers. So, for example, you know, um, if the government has an overall uh, strategic priority uh, to uh, excel in uh, export and import or to, you know, uh, uh, be an IT hub uh, and things like that, uh, the education should really follow uh, uh, that. Uh, then when you go one level down in terms of, you know, a department within that, uh, you know, ministry, uh, they should really be looking at, you know, what are those strategic uh, drivers at the ministry level and how they can contribute uh, to it. So, you know, they, they, each department might have their own departmental plan for the year. Uh, but again, those departmental plan, they should really be aligned, you know, with the overall uh, ministry. Uh, then it goes down all the way till we get to the employee level, the individuals there. So each individual in each department, uh, they should really have some sort of like a, 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 a yearly objective that really support the department objective, which support the minister objective, which support the government objective, you know. Uh, and without really this proper cascade down, you know, you can't really deliver your strategy. You know, it, it is literally just, you know, it's, 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 it's a nice piece of paper, you know. If you can't cascade it, you know, it is not really, uh, uh, you know, uh, of a great value. Uh, this on the left, but when you look at the right hand side here as well, uh, yes, we need to cascade things down, but also we need to measure things. So the same way we've done the cascading down, you know, we measure things up also in, 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 in very similar manner. So we manage employee performance based on the individual objective that, that they've created and support their uh, departmental plan. We manage the performance of divisions, you know, based on the KPIs that they've agreed initially and it was part of uh, the measurement for the objective that they set internally to support the, 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 the ministry generally. And the same for the ministry. Yeah. We're running out of time. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll conclude quickly uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, the, the, the very last uh, slide is, uh, this is a story of, uh, of, uh, of John uh, uh, Kennedy. Um, uh, and, and basically, you know, he was working, in, walking around NASA headquarters you know, in 1961, uh, you know, looking at the facility being introduced uh, you know, uh, to various people. And he looked at the janitor uh, you know, who was actually mobbing the floor at that time. And he asked him, you know, uh, uh, what do you do here? You know, so like John Kennedy asked the, the, you know, the janitor, what do you do here? And the uh, answer of the janitor was, you know, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. You know, that's how, you know, the, the vision of the organization was cascaded all the way down to, uh, to the lowest level, you know, uh, or, you know, across the organization. And that's really demonstrate, you know, good understanding of the vision, really wanting to be part of that vision for that organization uh, and being engaged and really feeling the contribution because you know the janitor is not less than anyone else in in, in the organization they have a vital role uh, and you know without we are all small building blocks you know and without those individual building blocks you know we can't really uh, you know deliver and and, and, and contribute uh, so uh, I'm gonna jump all these uh, do we have uh, two minutes for a small video yeah, okay, two minutes. <laughs> Sorry. So basically, this is, uh, I mean, I did, normally we go through. Uh, sorry. Uh, so th th this is one of our uh, product. Okay, I'll, uh, Dr. Mohammed, I think I'm having technical difficulties. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. I'll share the link 
uh, after after this. I, I heard Muhammad, from sorry to interrupt. But, you can carry on the question and I will find it and I will uh, upload it for you. I'll share it, yeah. No. Okay, you no can problem. go for the questions, uh, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, uh, the Dr. Mohammed al Haj, thank you very much. This was a very insightful presentation. It helped tie in the entire day together. Uh, I mean, when you your first presentation, your first slide, when you said the words SWAT and pastel, you gave me nightmares, reminded me of the nightmares of my MBA days, but <laughs> they're all behind us now. And then you started linking into the vision and the mission and you started bringing in these business acronyms and I was trying to see how this is going to link in together but you defined it very well in terms of what is the strategy for the company or the organization or the government and how does that manifest itself into an operational side of things i.e the day-to-day -day activities rather than just the general vision of it and then from then on, you linked it to the data, all the sessions that we talked about, about the transforming, knowing the company and understanding the values, the value of communication. And you brought in the data element and how data drives the operations, which drives the vision, which drives the strategy. And then later on, you linked it to the first session today where we talked about the academic development. And you gave a good example of the Sudan development where we, during our presentations, highlighted some of the limitations in terms of human capacity development and infrastructure and uh, lack of communication and fuel issues and other things like that. So this was a very good strategic uh, top level rather than operational level where you linked in what we aspire to do and how data can help us transfer all these things together here. Uh, I mean, can you, can you elaborate a little bit further on how we can use some of the data in terms of uh, the oper from an operational point of view and how does that trickle into the strategy point of view? You had a graph, I think, where you said the operations and then the strategy and they were... Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Mohammed, sorry to interrupt you. I have the video. Shall I play it for you before you start your questions? Yeah, uh, sure. No, okay, I will do that now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I think I have, I, I, even myself, I need to remind how to share it. Just one second. I think it should work now. Can you hear it? Yeah. Uh, j j just some context on that video before I. Uh, uh, yeah, feel I free. Uh, uh, so it's basically, is um, uh, uh, this is a product that we've made uh, to literally help people to translate things from strategy all the way down to uh, individual initiative, then help them to monitor uh, those initiative. If we had more time, normally what I do at the end of this, I you know, instead of showing the video, I'll will literally say like you know. That, that's a strategic objective that went down to, uh, to you know, uh, 
linked to the vision and it went down to uh, uh, translate it to a project. Then from the project, this activity came and so on and so forth. Uh, but maybe in the future, you know, we, we can go through that. So uh, answering the question, you know, the, the, the link between data and, uh, uh, and strategy. Okay. So uh, n n normally, um, uh, the, the, I mean, the way we the way we look at things is you know we, we don't see data linked to strategy directly. They, they, we see it linked and generated by some sort of middle tier, you know, right. and that middle tier, uh, you know. So for example, you know, if if we look at something as very simple as invoice invoice processing in a finance function, you know, someone is submitting for, you know an invoice, uh, someone else is taking that invoice and you know uh, doing various approvals and someone else doing the payment you know so there is various data element uh, linked to that invoice at the various stages uh, the way we uh, have those uh, the, the, the relationship we see that you know data is linked to the processes and the process is linked to the strategy you know okay. so you know like um, the strategy get cascaded down in terms of, you know, ways of doing things, you know? Uh, but then there is the, su the supporting element in terms of like, you know, classification of those data, you know? Uh, security standards, you know, of, uh, of those data. Uh, reutilization of the data. So for example, if, if our business process is, is, in, is very well integrated and it's end to end, you know, some of the concept of, you know, entering data once from a system point of view, you know, can be implemented uh, successfully, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, if, um, and you see this a lot, I mean, we see this normally in system implementation when it come and, and, you know, you have to go and input something and in a different system on a three screen later on, you go and input the same thing, you know, yeah. and, 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 and normally, the, 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 that divider and, and that break in, in, in the journey is related more to breaking the business process itself. So the business process that was used to develop the system, which is driving that data, is, is, is broken itself. And uh, men, many organizations normally, they try to fix that on the technology front, you know, uh, or on the data level, and not going back to the business process and, 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 and fix that. And, and what they end up with, that they had very bad business process and that very bad business process is now automated. So you can't even work around it. So things okay. used to take 15 uh, signatures, you know, to get something approved rather than going back and say, okay, do we need the 15? No, we only need three. Okay, we need three now. Let's build a system that, you know, take us to the three signature. Yeah. We go and build a system that, uh, you know, automate the 15 signatures. So even though previously before automation, you used to get, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to get an exemption and things like that uh, is not helping. And that impacts directly the data as well, you know. No, no, no. Um, I, I appreciate what you're saying because uh, as someone who works for universities, uh, I live this in a daily basis where the layers of operational strategies are different from the organizational strategies. And all of a sudden, as you said, the the the, the process that's being put in is based on the legacy rather than the improved system. Improved. And once it's improved, once it's implemented, we are stuck with it. And yeah. I think this is one of the elements where COVID has highlighted some of the errors in the previous strategies. And that's where we're teasing out all these different tools and re-imaging the way we educate people and what is the new norm in terms of distance learning in terms of open university functionalities with remote labs and other things like that. So I appreciate exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. We have a question from the FB, which I assume the Facebook. It's important presentation about strategy data uh, link with the NGOs or institution. I hope you link it with the resource and lack of knowledge and skills. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, uh, uh, th th this is very critical because you know, if you don't have the knowledge, you cannot execute the, you know, the activities. But again, uh, like probably very similar to the way uh, maybe I've answered the data uh, questions, we looked at the business process as that linkage as well because the business process, 
is the place where you would actually identify the skills of the individuals need to carry the task. So, you know, if the task is basically, you know, uh, uh, to go and diagnose uh, certain error in a machine, you know, so uh, the process for that diagnosis will be documented in a business process, you know, and that will probably be the right layer to link the, the skills needed to deliver that process. Again, not the data. You know, yeah. so I mean that I mean we probably look at things a little bit different, but we really see business processes is the intermediary that you know bring everything together. Like you know, it brings the skills, the HR element, and uh, not only the skills, uh, even the organizational element. So the, do I have things in one department or two departments? You know, yeah. and 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 again, you know, we see the organization to be structured properly and effectively and efficiently. Uh, it needs to be driven by the business, uh, uh, by the business facets of of uh, uh, of the organization. So yes, the 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 the, the skills is a critical element, uh, but you cannot really look at raw data, and decide from that raw data what my job description should should look like. Yeah. You know? But yeah. if you look at the business process, which also drive the data, you know, you can use that actually, you know, to to to. Uh, uh, to drive, you know, the, 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 the whole sort of like skills required, uh, how those skills can be categorized, categorized into various positions, how those positions can be realigned in org unit, and can how, uh, how those org uh, unit can together make up an overall organization structure. Okay, that, that's quite interesting. And uh, can, can you give us a brief introduction in terms of the strategy and the risk? Because uh, at one of the stages we talked today is re-imaging the universities in terms of moving to entrepreneurial organization where innovation is at the heart of it to generate income or self-perpetuating income and sustainable income. Yeah. So there's a big element of risk with that. And uh, at the university as an entity in the new norm after COVID has to change and realign the structures and strategies in association with innovation and entrepreneurship. So how do you see uh, your trickling down of the strategy coming down features itself? So uh, the, 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 the way again, to be honest, you know, I'm, I'm probably taking the pure, uh, pure consulting approach in, 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 into this. You know, the, 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 the slide where I've gone through and I've said, you know, like to do, to translate strategy, there is two vehicles. Yeah. Uh, one vehicle is the ongoing, you know, improvement project and the rest of it. And the other vehicle is, you know, the ongoing business processes. Uh, so from a risk management point of view, normally there is two type of risk. There is enterprise risk management, you know, which is that normally uh, related to the BAUs, you know, it's like, so the business as usual uh, type uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, uh, of processes and services and operation. Uh, then there is the project management risk, which is related to, to, uh, to the project. So I think the question is like going back is uh, uh, for those universities to really transform and change the way they do things, what are the vehicle for that transformation? Is it new initiatives? Is it new learning system, for example? You know, uh, is it different ways in, 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 in how things uh, being managed? Uh, then, you know, after that risk management risk is risk management, you know, it's like, you know, we identify, we categorize, you know, we need to mitigate and, uh, and, and we monitor. Uh, but how, how we implement it will depend on which vehicle actually we are using because, you know, uh, yes, there is very key decisions, not just in education, actually, you know, it's across all industries now, you know, uh, post COVID, uh, you know, uh, the new world, after COVID, you know, everyone is using that, uh, that, 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 that right now, is uh, what is your vehicle to translate your organization uh, into, you know, tangible action, you know? Are we changing the way we do things or are we bringing new things on board? We're getting new systems, you know, we're getting uh, uh, new training programs, you know? So for example, you know, uh, uh, I, will, I had a client in UAE, in Abu Dhabi, uh, at the start of the COVID, uh, uh, and uh, it was a group of private schools, uh, and they wanted to, you know, switch into uh, e-learning, you, know, uh, you know, for the various reasons, like everyone. And one of the things that group did, 
which is uh, properly not many other schools did. Uh, I think even in the UK there was some issues as well. Uh, they they did give all the teachers two weeks full time training on how they can deliver and represent and manage the kids online. Okay, you know. And it's, 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 it's been really, really beneficial for those schools because, you know, for many other teachers, it was just left to them. You know, I mean, they, they had their materials, uh, their method of delivery. It was very specific. You know, they used to it. You know, their experience, they've been doing it, you know, times and times again uh, over the year. Uh, suddenly, once you take everything, you know, you take the board away, you know, uh, you take the eye contacts uh, away. Uh, and even from the kids and the students, you know, you take the side conversation away. So like, you know, like I was sitting next to my colleague, you know, the teacher, you know, or the lecturer, you know, was, you know, yeah. you know, going through it. But, you know, maybe I would write small comment in a paper and I would give it over. That's, an, that's part of the experience of being taught, you know, yeah. for some of those guys. Uh, so uh, uh, these schools, they did something about it. You know, they didn't just say, uh, you know, they didn't, they did not just say, okay, uh, uh, our strategy now is to deliver online, get on with it. You know, they took that, they translated that one into, you know, training programs, deliver those training programs, monitor them, measure them, then here we go. You know, like, you know, those teachers had the, the, the enablers, basically, yeah. to mm-hmm. execute that. And th- this links in with what we talked about capacity development earlier on in the first session before the data management sessions. Uh, it's very important because all of a sudden to sustain our organizations, our functionalities, uh, and maintain our vision and strategy and income and other things like that, we became you know, reactive instead of proactive into the systems. And this is big element that COVID has exposed all organizations, not just academia, everywhere else. I mean, all of a sudden in March, we had to move teaching from, as you said, a board into an online platform and teaching March, May and June, the April, May, June was a nightmare for all of us because we were not skilled. But the fact that we incubated over the summer, we developed our strategies, we started implementing things like VBOX and in- integrating the classroom and making it synchronous, making it more interactive has enabled us. So capacity development has enabled that, but that meant we had to react as fast as possible. And that's why visions and strategies became very important in terms of execution, the operational elements here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed Hajj. Please go ahead. Uh, th- thank you. I mean, well, well, one of the other things is, is, is uh, I mean, you know, like we are working with Zoom now, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so properly to train someone on Zoom, you know, literally, you know, that's how you log in. These are the various options. That's where you do the test, blah, 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 all of that. It doesn't take more than 20 minutes. Yeah. So you could invest that 20 minutes in upskilling the individuals or you could give them the username and password and let them suffer with it for days before they can get used to it. And, and, and literally, then just picking up those key areas of, of investment to, is, 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 is really critical. I mean, nowadays we started using elements like VBOX and Collaborate and other things where we are trying to mimic a real life experience inside it and ensure engagement by asking the questions. So the vision, the strategy, the reactiveness of, to the system has became a process of innovation where we have to innovate things in terms of the operations here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, thank you very much. It's been fascinating to listen to you and listen to all our guests today. Uh, I think my job here is done and I'll leave you in the capable hands of our organizer, Dr. Adlam, to take us towards the end line now. Thank you very much, Firman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both Muhammad and Muhammad. And I think, first of all, we'd like to thank you both. Uh, I think we need to give a big applause for Muhammad al Haj Ferris. Well, I think he did his best in, uh, I know these people are very busy, but uh, Professor Muhammad Hassan said thank you very much. I think for, I understand it because we are working. Today is a working day in the UK. All of, not only you, all of those people who are giving us their time uh, starting from yesterday, starting with Petro from the UN. I appreciate your time, and uh, we had to do it during the day. It has been a very busy day. We, we, we never thought we would finish, uh, not just uh, on time, but even before the time. And I think that's thanks to you, Mohammed Hassan. I think we're going to rely heavily on you now on chairing uh, all our conferences now. It would be my pleasure. Really on time. Now it's almost five past three, and I'm really uh, appreciating that because Thursday, 
it's the last day of the week in most uh, Arab countries in the Middle East. So it's better to let them go free earlier. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.